Watson? Absent. Councillor McGinty? Here. Councillor Roberts? Present. Uh, Councillor Ann Swift Kayata? Here. Uh, student Representative Kristen Aliyah? Here. And Student Representative Jamie Clucci? And the manager is present and the clerk is absent. Thank you. And you're the acting clerk? Apparently. Pledge of Allegiance, please. <laughs> Reports and correspondence, please. Jack. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. We have a nice full audience here tonight, and I'd like to let everybody know that we still have vacancies available on boards and commissions for all you civic-minded persons. <laughs> In fact, we have uh, openings on uh, nine different boards and commissions, the Arts Commission, Community Services, Conservation Commission, Family Fund Day Committee, Fort Williams Advisory Committee, the Planning Board, Recycling Committee, Riverside uh, Cemetery Trustees, Thomas Memorial Library, and the Zoning Board of Appeals. And we do not, at this point, have enough applications to fill all those slots, so we really are looking for people to come forward and be willing to uh, volunteer and donate their time to the community. Um, as far as I know, this is the first year in many years where we have not had enough applications to fill those slots. In fact, we had a number of years ago, the council put on term limits just to make sure we could open up enough slots uh, so people could all have an opportunity to come forward and serve. I'm not sure what's happened, um, but we need your help, and we are looking for those applications. And there's no particular deadline. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll, the appointments committee will be trying to fill them. And if we have vacancies, we'll just keep on waiting till we can get them and keep trying to encourage people to come forward. So please, if you have some interest in any one of those committees, uh, the application is found on the website. You can contact the manager's office. They'll be sure to get one to you. Thank you. Councilor Berry. Uh, Madam Chairman, I have uh, two quick announcements. One, uh, I'd like to congratulate all the members of the community for uh, contributing to the fire department's uh, thermal imaging uh, fundraiser over here. We have a little over $40,000 toward a $50,000 goal. And, uh, so I know the fire chief and the members of the rescue unit and the fire department would appreciate if we could put that over the top for these thermal, um, thermal imaging uh, equipment pieces. He thinks that they're very valuable for the town. And in the South Portland City Hall today, I understand they used one of those machines to find a fire without using an ax. So uh, that's one point. Uh, thank you for everybody who has contributed. And number two, I uh, had a number of uh, questions from senior citizens who uh, receive Social Security and that uh, the tax uh, bills are due on the third of the month in a number of cases. We cannot change the one coming up in May 2001 because they're already planned for. But after that, uh, for those senior citizens who are receiving Social Security, some of whom have contacted me, being the oldest member of the council, I think, uh, that. Uh, the uh, Social Security checks being deposited on the third of the month. We'll try to make the tax bills due on the fourth or fifth uh, after those checks have been uh, deposited in the uh, Social Security accounts for the people. That's it. I don't see any senior citizens out there, Henry. No senior. No, I'm, I'm the uh, only one, I guess. But no I senior citizens in Cape Elizabeth. Um, Thank town manager's report. Oh, does anybody else have anything else? Uh, Councilor McGinty. Um, the Cumberland County Budget Advisory Committee will be ha holding a public hearing in Portland at the Cumberland County Courthouse this Wednesday at 7 p.m. If anyone's interested in their county taxes, um, they're projected to go up about 9 percent this year. So if anybody wa wants to have any input for the county commissioners, that committee, which I serve on, will be meeting 7 p.m. Wednesday at the Cumberland County Courthouse. Thank you. Town Manager, report. Just briefly, a couple of items. First, I'd like to thank Deborah Lane in, in absentia for all her work coordinating the, the recent uh, election. Uh, last week, I had to think about when it was. Uh, it, it really worked well. Uh, I think all the citizens who appeared at the voting place, as well as those that uh, nearly one-tenth of the voters who voted absentee, 
Uh, everything seemed to go very, very well, and want to thank uh, citizens for their participation, as well as uh, all the other departments who cooperated as well in, in that process. Uh, secondly, I wanted to make mention that the Town Council will be holding a special meeting uh, on the 27th of this month. Uh, at that meeting will be a public hearing on the proposed purchase of 343 Ocean House Road, uh, which is known as, uh, well, probably perhaps well, best well known as the, the Pond Cove Millwork property. Again, that's November 27th. Uh, also, later this week, the town will be opening bids on the work that's due to occur on the renovation of the old public works garage into a police station and on the construction of a new police station on the current site of the fire and police station. It is possible that that will be on the town council agenda to award that contract on November 27th. Uh, we'll look at the bids when they come in on the 16th and see if, see if it in a, is in a position to be ready to come to you on the 27th. If it's not ready to come, <coughs> otherwise it'll come to your regular December meeting. But the hope is that it will be in a position to uh, be considered on the evening of the 27th as well. But we'll know better after the bids are open this week. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Anything, anything else? Can I say one thing? I'm yep, sorry. yes. I've been so involved in this presidential thing following, following that. Um, I want to thank everybody who supported my campaign um, last week uh, for the state representative position and offer my congratulations to Janet on her election. Thank you. Madam Chairwoman, I'd like to know, I've, I had back surgery a month ago, and if I'm standing up while people are talking, don't, uh, be, don't be surprised, but I did not want to miss the meeting, and I am here. That's all. Now, uh, minutes of the um, citizens' discussion. Oh, citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. Hearing none, we'll move on to approval of the minutes of the last meeting, October second, four and twelve. Madam Chairman. Councillor Barry. I move that the minutes, as read for those three meetings, be accepted. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor? Thank you. Item number 47, uh, public hearing and action on a, upon a petition requesting that all of Jordan Farm Road be a paved road with full-time access. Um, before we get into the, the uh, public part of the meeting, I just wanted to say a few things. Um, one of them is, I mean, I'm going to say a, a, several things and give some, some parameters for this meeting because this looks like even more people than I had on those sewer meetings. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure, that was a biggie. Um, that this is not a town pr proposal, that this is a citizen's initiative, and that's how this came forward. And that the council, for this kind of public hearing, and all public hearings, is here to listen. We need the input of students, I mean of, uh, <laughs> any of you, <laughs> the input of all the citizens to help us make decisions. We have several ways of, of getting this information. One of them is by having a public hearing and having citizen input. Councilors usually on their own will go to visit the site, uh, walk it, look at it. So you probably have seen over the weeks a few of us there. Uh, we also ask the manager to supply us with a great deal of information, especially regarding finances, financing of any number of possible proposals that might come out of this public hearing so that that information is made available to us. And uh, we have been supplied with all the history on the issue, and this is what we have had to read to keep ourselves up to date. So we're prepared for your comments. Um, there are some basic rules in a public hearing, and I would ask that each of you who speaks try to limit your comments to five minutes, and, and that's actually a little bit longer. We sometimes do three to five. Um, but, and if somebody is saying exactly what you want to say, we certainly are happy to hear from you, but if you, you might feel that you don't have to say it if somebody else says it, but that's certainly up to you. Um, it's not likely that counselors will ask questions of you. You, like us, are citizens, and your um, opinions living in the neighborhood are citizens' opinions. I mean, if there's a geologist, hydrologist, or you know, some professional, that would be more appropriate for us to ask questions at that time, maybe. But it's not that we don't have questions. Counselors can write down, and they can ask questions later. But if you get into a debate of going back and forth, it's not fair to the next people who are waiting to speak. So we want to hear you. We want you to have an opportunity to speak. And, we, and if we want to ask questions, we, we will do that, but maybe not at the exact time that you're standing up there, because um, we do want to be fair to everybody. Um, one of the ways, another ways that you could speed this up is if 
if you stand like three people up there, because there's sort of downtime for the TV audience. If one person speaks and makes their way back to their seat, and, and then you're waiting for the next person to come, there's nothing on, there's nobody talking, and there's nothing moving, and nobody speaking. So if three people were there, and one spoke and went to their seat, and you just kept moving that way, it would sort of keep it moving and keep, it, keep you able to move out of your rows. And so the TV people then have constant sort of <laughs> know, what's go know what's going on. Um, and as usual, we are all citizens, both you and us in the council, and so we hope that you respect everybody. These are the most difficult kinds of public hearings because they involve whole neighborhoods, and there's a lot of passion that comes with whatever the issue is in a neighborhood, so they're difficult for each of you who have different opinions. Um, so remember to respect others and listen, and uh, we will do our best, and um, these are the tough decisions for all of us. That's what you pay us for, of course, these tough decisions, I'm sure. <laughs> I think that I'm, I, um, it is appropriate to direct your comments to the council, but I want to make sure that the TV guy can see people speak. And that looks like it's, John, could you sort of turn okay. that a little bit more? Thank you. Because it looks like it's really, they're, they're only going to get the back of the person speaking. Thanks. There was a lot of information on this particular issue. I just want the TV to be able to see that, not yeah. just the backs of the people. Or this way? Yeah. That, that'll cover. Does that angle look good, Harry? <laughs> Thank you very much. I declare this public hearing open. Please, if you have comments, um, come forward. We're anxious to hear what you have to say. Oh, oh, the other thing is, you please give us your name and your address, because that's part of our record. Thank you. My name is Richard Sullivan. I live at 72 Two Lights Road. And I want to begin by thanking the town for making available all the uh, data uh, which to document the, the long history that uh, this uh, issue has been before the town. And I want to thank also Tricia Washman for making this available to me. And as I look through the uh, proceedings from 10 years ago, there was a public hearing on the permit for wetlands alteration for the Highlands back in 1990. And at that time, for the first time, the town brought forward the proposition that um, an open road be established. And they gave uh, two reasons. Uh, they said the two reasons for justifying the large road were first, the need for access for emergency vehicles, and second, the need to relieve congestion in Broad Cove. And at that time, um, I, I asked several questions. First, why? access for emergency vehicles could not be accomplished by a one-lane road limited only to emergency vehicles. And secondly, I asked um, that the, the town hasn't shown that there is any less congestion on Two Lights Road than on Broad Cove. I pointed out that Broad Cove, that Two Lights is also a narrow road that serves a cul-de-sac of more than 100 houses, in addition to a state park, a high-volume restaurant, and a lighthouse attraction. And I asked why a large road should be constructed through major wetlands in order to route traffic from one congested road to another. And here we are 10 years later, <laughs> and I would submit that the two questions uh, that, uh, that we addressed that night, namely the issue of public safety and the issue of, of um, moving traffic from one neighborhood to the other, are the issues that are uh, paramount before us tonight. And the town, in its wisdom, uh, did enact a limited access gated road, which has served us for 10 years um, and has served us very well. The, uh, uh, during this time, uh, the road has opened several times in response to accidents and the need for emergency vehicles and counselors, I mean, and the uh, citizens to travel these roads. Um, and um, as to my According to my take on the issue, uh, the, at this point, the town is satisfied with the limited access status of the road. Mike McGovern, in his uh, background materials on October 25th, said Jordan Farm Road itself works well as an emergency access road as public ownership and municipal responsibility ensures appropriate maintenance. 
Um, I uh, sent an email to um, our uh, police chief, Neil Williams, asking him two questions. Have there been any problems in access of the police department to Broad Cove because Jordan Farm Road is gated? And he replied, the police department has not had any problems with access to Broad Cove Road. However, we have had occasions where the internal roadway system of Broad Cove has been blocked in some form or other, which could have or did require us to utilize Jordan Farm Road as an emergency access. I also asked, should any changes be made to the gate to improve access? And he replied, as far as the department is concerned, the locking mechanism now in place is adequate for our gaining entry when the need arises. Um, so it seems then that we now have had this at limited access road for 10 years. The town officials uh, are happy with its, with its status as preserving uh, public safety. And I would uh, submit that uh, this issue is uh, no longer uh, needs to be seriously debated. And so if we can put aside the issue of public safety, then all we're really left with is the issue of quality of life, which is the other, um, the other issue that was uh, addressed in the petition. And so uh, Broadco says that, that uh, they have concerns about quality of life as affected by traffic. Um, but as I said 10 years ago, Two Lights Road also has traffic. Uh, we commissioned uh, a, re a study by uh, a, a traffic engineer, uh, Diane Morabito, and uh, comparing two lights and Broad Cove roads. And uh, she noted that the average annual daily traffic on Broad Cove Road has risen from 1620 in 1992 to 1740 in 1995 to 2110 in 1997. And um, during this time, the traffic on Broad Cove Road always lags behind that on two lights. Uh, and these, this correlates with the traffic uh, data just uh, obtained this fall, again showing Two Lights Road having more traffic than Broad Cove Road. Um, she concludes that the level of traffic is, is greater on Two Lights than on Broad Cove, and that our rate of increase has been uh, greater than Broad Cove over this time. Virgil, she says that the traffic the level of traffic does not represent any capacity or congestion concerns. She also reviewed the safety analysis, um, accident review, as well as did a, a, a field review of both the Two Lights Road and Broad Cove Road. And she uh, summarized by saying the, the, the existing traffic volumes are similar on both roadways, with Two Lights Road having the greatest existing traffic volume. There are no high accident locations which would indicate a safety deficiency along either roadway. Both roadways meet minimum recommended travel lane widths. Could you please come to summary? Yes, I will. Seven minutes, thank you. Yes, and so you've been asked to enhance the quality of life of a small number of residents of Broad Cove at the expense of the wetlands, the Greenbelt Walkway, and the quality of life of Two Lights Road, not to mention the $150,000 expense to pave the road. So I would submit that the responsible way to address the Broad Cove concerns about quality of life is to look to speed, in, speed enforcement on Broad Cove, not send the traffic through the wetlands onto two lights. And I would con <coughs> conclude with a, uh, a saying that my friend and neighbor, Sally Kennedy, often uses, and that is uh, when she's in a situation like this, she says, been there, done that, bought a t-shirt. <laughs> so I'd like to conclude by saying I've been here, I've done that, and last Friday, <laughs> I bought a t-shirt. <laughs> that says, preserve our wetlands, 1900, 2000, and 2000, question mark. So I, I hope that you decide this issue once and for all so that I can never have to wear this T-shirt again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, I'm sorry, I didn't come prepared with a T-shirt, and I don't think you want me to take my shirt off, so uh, I think I'll just talk tonight. <laughs> well, you know, you might be surprised, actually. Um, good evening. Uh, my name is Asher Kramer, and I've lived on Ledgewood Lane in Broad Cove for the past year and a half. We thank the Town Council for affording us the opportunity to discuss this important issue. We stand before you tonight in part in response to Michael McGovern's letter to Peter Kennedy in 1994, stating that the only 
way the road could be fully opened and paved would be through a vote of the town council with a permit to the DEP. He further stated that the town would not approach DEP without a huge public outcry to have this road opened up. We believe that this citizen's petition meets that condition. As the gentleman prior to me stated, this is a long-standing and complex issue. And in reviewing the records of the planning board hearings 10 years ago, we see that many of the reasons that were stated then have been articulated before and will be articulated tonight. So what's changed since then? The situation has gotten worse. More homes have been built and the unacceptable concentration of traffic has worsened. We are convinced that our testimony tonight will make the job easier as we believe that the arguments in favor of a second vote are so compelling and reasonable. We note there are some, including a current member of the council, who is on record in the past as actively opposing the opening of Jordan Farm Road. We are, however, confident that all council members will take this opportunity to approach this issue with a fresh look, an open mind, and a fair-minded approach to make the right decision. I'm only one of the many homeowners in Broad Cove who believe it's long past due that a second road be opened. You will hear tonight individual testimony from these residents discussing specifically the neighborhood history, volume of traffic, and safety issues. Additionally, you will hear testimony from a prominent environmental attorney, Jeffrey Thaler of Bernstein Shore, and Steve Pelletier, a certified wildlife biologist and professional <coughs> wetland scientist that will address the fact that there are no insurmountable legal or environmental impediments to opening this road. Let me state clearly, this petition is supported by the majority of the homeowners in Broad Cove. 147 of the homeowners in the neighborhood signed the petition that reads in part, <clears throat> we the residents of Broad Cove neighborhood by our signature demand that the town of Cape Elizabeth open up a second access road into our neighborhood. The level of development has rendered the current single access unacceptable <coughs> for the following reasons. The concentration of traffic degrades the quality of neighborhood life. Public safety, particularly that of young children, is jeopardized. The roadways were not designed to handle the current level of traffic, and the current situation is not fair to all residents of the neighborhood. We therefore request that the Jordan Farm be, Road be open to the public. This is the will of the people. Now, if I could ask, for this map, it's not as pretty as the map that you have, but if you could let the council members see this, please. In red here is the current road way that the traffic needs to be funneled down. Three quarters of a million cars, over three quarters of a million cars, go down this road. Tightly congested neighborhood. I would ask you to consider the following facts. And if someone else could uh, perhaps hold this up as well. On the, um, on the streets, highlighted in red, there are 93 homes that are directly impacted by the funneling of this traffic. 93 homes tightly packed right up on the roadway that are impacted by this traffic. The blue here is the road in question. There are currently 15 homes impacted and in the area where the gravel road is, there are currently two homes with a third home abutting the wetlands being constructed as we speak. On the portion of Two Lights Road up to 77, there's an additional 16 homes. 93 homes currently subjected to three quarters of a million cars and 31 homes. And on Two Lights, it's not tightly packed on the highway, they're set back. Now, <clears throat> I would um, say that the numbers speak for themselves, that opening this road would benefit the clear majority of the residents. In fact, one of the 93 residents felt this street was, and I quote, the doormat to the neighborhood benefiting the few who enjoyed the chain right of way. I would like to address a few points in Mr. McGovern's cover letter to the council. It's been suggested that the road would need to be widened to 34 feet, including sidewalks. This is a, um, and if you'll excuse the pressure, there's no, uh, no uh, prejudice intended. This is an absurd suggestion to create a road 34 feet wide serving two homes when these conditions do not exist for the 93 homes currently being subjected to this traffic. Secondly, the cost to pave Jordan Farm Road at 20 or 22 feet would be 25 to 30,000, not the 150,000 as quoted. Both the 34 foot requirement and the cost are simply designed to assure that this road could never be passed by the DEP or acceptable to the town from a cost perspective. 
Finally, the options to better enforce speed or build speed tables is not the issue here, although there is still a problem with a minority of residents driving unacceptably fast. The main issue is the volume of traffic concentration <laughs> on the streets. Finally, the role of elected government is to do the best for the majority of the people. The second vote is demanded by the majority of the residents. This is a three-step process, town council, planning board, and DEP. We urge the town council to move this issue to the planning board so that the process to open up this road may continue. Thank you. My name is Rich Riker. I live at 5 Jordan Farm Road and have lived there since September of this year. Prior to that, I lived in Shore Acres uh, and have lived there since 1992. Um, my wife has looked at every house that's been on the market in Cape Elizabeth in the last five years. Uh, we have five children and uh, we loved our home in Jordan Farm Road, uh, I'm sorry, in uh, Shore Acres. Uh, but as our family grew and our children grew, we needed to uh, move to a larger home. And we looked at many, many homes. And one question I would ask this council is, what is it fair to ask our town government to do? And I hope to address that issue in my comments tonight. Um, we, uh, we have so many beautiful things about our town, the seacoast, the woods, the fields. And we all wish that we had many uh, of those uh, areas in our home. Many of us wish we lived on the water. but. If we bought a home that wasn't on the water, would it be reasonable to ask the town council to dredge out the land between our home and the water so that we could have a waterside home? I don't think that would be reasonable. Um, there are uh, so many things that you need to consider when you buy a home, and not the least of those is where that home is located, what advantages there are with that location. And uh, when we bought our home, as I said, we looked at many, many homes, but never considered placing a bid on a home that was in a high traffic area. We have small children, and we did not think that was a reasonable place for us to have our home. I would argue that anyone who has lived in the Broad Cove area for a year and a half, as the previous speaker has, knew before they purchased their home that that was a high traffic area. Just as I don't think it's reasonable to ask the town council to move the coastline to be adjacent to property, I'm not sure that it is reasonable to ask the town council to divert traffic away from an area where it exists at present to benefit people who bought homes in that area. Uh, I appreciate the, the many issues that are raised by this concern, and I would ask that the town council consider what is fair to do for people who have purchased homes with the consideration of traffic in mind and that the changes proposed by this um, petition would uh, unjustly uh, impact people who made that decision and considered traffic in their decision to buy their home. Thank you. Good evening. Wait, My wait name is Bob Packer. Wait a minute, Bob. I, I would like to say one thing. I don't know how many, it must be 100 people here. And if we clap after each person, I now, it was great the first time because I could see where everybody now is sitting and what, you know, but it, it really would be helpful. And I know you, whichever side you're on, you approve of whatever the person's saying, and I know it and you know it, and, and I would really appreciate it if you would try to n not applaud. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, Penny, I like applause, but. That's, that's all right, Bob. My name is Bob Packer, and in 1973, I bought a piece of land on Hunts Point Road and built my home where I still reside. We moved into the house 27 years ago this Thanksgiving. In those days, beyond my property, there were only seven homes all the way down Running Tide Road. In a snowstorm in 1978, my wife was coming down Broad Cove Road and around the bend where the Lunts live now. She saw a truck coming out of the Broad Cove that was, appeared to be out of control. She stopped and she was hit by Jonesy's tow truck. Fortunately, no one was hurt. This happened prior to the school bus coming in. And in those days, we probably only had one or two coming in. The road was blocked for better, the better part of an hour since it took two tow trucks, one to tow the tow truck and the other to tow my wife's car. That was back when we had little traffic and population in Broadcoat. 
The current situation of a single access road into our neighborhood was never intended when the development was envisioned. Secondary routes had been planned. The current situation is not safe, convenient, attractive, and does not include two or more means of access. We are sitting on a time bomb, ticking time bomb. Before a tra tragedy happens, let's open Farm Pond on Road. This should be done prior to the snow falling this year. A temporary winter, winter hot top could be done with a finished coat in the spring. Let's think about the safety of our family, friends, neighbors, and move to react before someone suffers a tragic loss of limb or life. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Lynn Lovett. Um, this is my husband, E.J. Lovett. We live at 31 Broad Cove Road and have lived on Broad Cove Road for 15 years. And 15 years ago, when we moved um, to 30 Broad Cove Road, um, we were concerned about the traffic flow on the street at that time, but when we moved here, there was little to be chosen from for temporary housing, which was what we were doing. We were renting a home um, while we were learning about where we live. Um, and since that time, of course, there have been many more homes built and the traffic flow has only increased. Um, in the 15 years that we've lived there, um, it's incredible how much the traffic has increased. And with the construction trucks going in and out, we live six houses in from Route 77. So the, uh, everybody goes by our house at least two times going in and out. We have had two dogs killed um, on our stretch of Broad Cove Road, our dogs. Um, and since we have just um, gotten a new dog, I've taken to walking up over the hill into Shore Acres, which is another dead-end neighborhood, but they have a grid system um, built into their neighborhood, and it's really very quiet during 7 and 8 o'clock in the morning when I'm walking my dog. It's practically impossible to walk on Broad Cove Road without jumping off the road into the siding um, to avoid being hit because no one yields to one another on our very narrow road when people are in a hurry coming and going. So. Um, I walk over into Shore Acres where it's very quiet and in those hours I'm passed by maybe two cars where on our street I'm passed by one probably every 30 seconds at least. Um, when we moved to Broad Cove, uh, we were told that there would be another opening to the neighborhood. Um, that's been the story I think a lot of people have been told over the years, but it was supposedly going to happen soon and that was 15 years ago. And We've all been here a number of times um, over wetlands concerns and everything else, but we do live on a very high pressure street <coughs> and um, it's very noisy, it's getting worse, um, and I'd love to see a, a resolution to the problem. Uh, to, to the point of numbers, and, and Red did a, a great job of uh, describing the statistics. Each day in front of our house, 1,950 cars go by. On an average 12 hour day, that's one every 22 seconds. Now, I understand that alleviating the problem in Broad Cove by sending it out uh, uh, Jordan Farm Road is just gonna be moving part of the problem. Approximately 630 cars would take the other entrance is the, the estimate from the traffic studies. That 630 cars represents greater than a 33% decrease in the uh, amount of traffic that would be moving uh, through the Broad Cove area. And yes, it would put it on to Two Lights Road, but Two Lights may be better able to uh, afford that uh, increase than Broad Cove is. And there are also other avenues for navigating Two Lights. There are two ways around Two Lights. Um, when you look back at uh, the, the, 90, uh, the 89 study, our um, learned town manager, Michael, um, uh, uh, had a number of, of interesting quotes in there to the, to the notion that the uh, traffic increase will result. Uh, Michael stated that because of the circuitous route of another full access road, Broad Cove would n uh, likely not become a shortcut to anywhere. So we're probably not going to have any increase in the traffic uh, moving through that area if we open up a second uh, entrance. Uh, as regards the uh, sightseeing, uh, if there is some, their impact will be cut in half because instead of traveling over the road twice, they'll only be traveling over the road once. So it, 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 back in 89, one of the concerns was that opening that up would in fact invite more people in. It's unlikely that that would be the case, as, as Michael stated. And then finally, to the volume of the traffic, the impact on the new access road would reduce traffic in Broad Cove, Salt Spray, and a portion of Hunts Point 
and clearly, as Asher described in the first presentation, a large number of homes would be impacted and a large number of families. So we urge the second row to be opened up. Thank you. Thank you. Would you pull the speaker down so that the TV audience can yeah. hear you? Good evening. My name is Jacqueline Hedlund and I live at One Ledgewood Lane. I am requesting that the Jordan Farm Road be opened because I strongly feel that the current single access road into the large Broad Cove development is not safe. I am the mother of a four-year-old and I worry about the volume of traffic on the road, especially at particular times of day such as the commuting hours. I have witnessed or heard about several near accidents involving the small children of just my immediate neighbors since moving into the neighborhood over two years ago. I think that evening out the flow of traffic will lessen this risk, especially if people do not need to drive almost two miles through the development just to get to Route 77. I also think this is an unacceptable risk in an emergency situation such as a house fire or medical emergency. Should Broad Cove Road become blocked for some reason at the um, end near 77, uh, a home on ledge would... Uh, uh, if, an, if an accident or an emergency occurred at a home on Ledgewood Lane, the response time would be greatly compromised by the need to use an unpaved chained road. If this development were being planned in its entirety now, a two-mile dead end for 230 homes would never be approved by a planning board for this very reason. Cross Hill, for instance, does not have a single access in and out. I helped gather signatures for the petition to open the road. Overwhelmingly, the concern of neighbors was safety, even if they were not directly affected by the traffic. There is no evidence, as stated by Police Chief Williams in our discussion with him, that crime would increase with two entrances into a neighborhood. Most people in Case Elizabeth have two ways to access their homes, and yet we do not experience a high crime rate in the Cape. This is the time to right a wrong and make neighborhood safety a top priority. Thank you. Thank you. Could you give me your last name again? Sir? Edlund. H E D L U N. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is John Hannes, and I've lived at 46 Broad Cove Road for one year. I witness daily the drawbacks of a single entrance road <coughs> servicing such an immense neighborhood. I took particular note of an interest in neighborhood traffic after being feet away from my mailbox and seeing it and an adjacent telephone box run over by a car leaving the road. I feel a true win-win situation for this neighborhood is to open a second existing taxpayer-supported road, Jordan Farm Road. Residents in the furthest, most remote areas of the neighborhood can exit more quickly with less impatient tailgating and with less traffic volume for much of the neighborhood, less distance driven for residents, and round-trip commercial vehicles would reduce emissions and gasoline use. Emergency response by fire, police, and ambulance can be accomplished more quickly and with less risk with the second access road open. Chief McGoldrick reported that it takes one less minute with chains already down on Jordan Farm to drive to Winding Way and the Hunts Point Road intersection from the Cape Variety Store rather than using the Broad Cove entrance. A minute can make a big difference in a response outcome possibly life or death. Also, every driveway poses a catastrophe for a responding emergency vehicle expediting to an emergency call. Their emergency response, which will likely be several vehicles, must pass by a hundred or more driveways to reach the neighborhood's deepest areas. Instead, they could enter close by, unimpeded on Jordan Farm Road in less time, safer, passing far fewer driveways, children, curves, intersections, and blind spots. Let's don't handicap the police, the fire department, and the ambulances. <coughs> this is only common sense. The town manager's 1989 memo mentions a number of other safety concerns relating to a chained emergency access road. Availability of keys to locks, winter plowing between and around gates, a blocked roadway with a parked car, Physicians responding to urgent calls being blocked by a single road closure, vandalism of the gates, the chains, the locks in the immediate area. I'm not comfortable with a single access into a neighborhood, no more than I would be in a theater with one door open and the other door chained closed with the key in some manager's office drawer. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Good evening, Madam Chair. My name is Jeff Thaler from Bernstein Shore, and I have prepared typewritten comments, which I'd like to distribute to the council and okay. student representative to speed things along if I could. Mm -hmm. I'll give a copy to the uh, other attorney here who I know is representing the other side, Mr. Kilbert, courtesy. Uh, members of the council, uh, I'm not here tonight. Let me tell you what I'm not here to do. I'm not here to debate traffic safety. I'm not here to debate fuel consumption or air pollution issues uh, or the specifics of wetlands delineation. Um, I have retained on behalf of some of the Broad Cove residents, Steve Pelletier, who is in line behind me. And, and is a uh, licensed wetland specialist who has been on site and will discuss what he has found and answer any questions you have. What I would like to do is just to focus narrowly on the process and, and where things can go from here. And uh, with that in mind, I want to again uh, remind the council that this is not the DEP tonight, it's not the BEP, and it's not the planning board. And I think a lot of what you're being asked to do maybe is beyond what you need to do. I don't think you need to reconcile competing arguments tonight about traffic safety or wetlands impact. I think that uh, what I want to at least address and to try to at least assure the council is at least in my professional opinion, the issue of whether or not the DEP would ever reconsider uh, the question of opening Jordan Pond Road and paving or not paving is not a dead issue. It's not a done issue, and I'll explain why, in my opinion, it's not, and Mr. Pelletier will explain why, as a scientist, he believes that it's not a dead issue, and in fact, that there's a very good chance for the town of Cape Elizabeth to go to the DEP at this time in light of circumstances that have changed since 1991 uh, and be able to get a modification of the underlying subdivision permit to meet the needs of the town currently. Based upon, I, I have reviewed some of the same materials you were uh, holding up earlier, Madam Chairman, uh, that was given to you by the town manager, which is a very thorough summary and compilation of what, what has gone on. Uh, and it's my opinion, and I know that uh, my, my fellow counsel from Verrill Dana will disagree with me on this, but I believe that there is a reasonable chance, a reasonable likelihood of success with DEP at this time for several reasons. First of all, uh, the DEP's order, one of the, there are four different orders that you've been given, but it's, it's not the 1996 order, the most recent one that's at issue. That had to do with changing water line locations for several lots. Uh, and in fact, in that one in 1996, DEP approved filling 4,188 feet of wetland. 1993 had to do with realigning and redesigning the emergency access road. Um, the real issue is the 1991 order, December 6, 1991, which I discussed at page two of the comments that I just gave you. And it is, it is that one that would have to go back to DEP and request them to reconsider. And the reason I say that circumstances have changed are the following. Since 1991, there have been two houses built on the unpaved portion of Jordan Farm Road. There's a third house that is going to be built that, it, that the uh, excavation is started for. So that what the DEP saw back in 1990, 1991 has changed. Secondly, the law has changed since 1990, 1991. And Mr. Pelletier can discuss that. So what DEPs was thinking of at that time and what the law was at that time is different. Third, we have uh, the changes of um, the, the fact that the concerns the DEP had raised at the time in terms of aesthetics and scenic about the gravel road fitting in better into the natural environment, uh, 
being changed significantly because of the houses that are there and because of the fact that there are cars that are driving already on the unpaved portion of the road. Certainly there's a gated part that, that they don't, but there is a part of the road that is unpaved that has houses and is a residential area now. Um, Mr. Pelletier will describe for you his professional opinion that paving the existing gravel road surface and opening the road to traffic should not represent a significant ecological threat to the adjacent existing wetland community. I've summarized that for you on page one, and, and he will give you his statements in a few minutes. Um, I just want to bring a couple other points to your attention. Having gone through the materials, what I think are some things for you to keep in mind, and that is that back in 1990, town officials, including the town engineer and the town planner, both pointed out that in Cape Elizabeth, all town accepted roads are paved, that most of the private emergency access roads in Cape Elizabeth are paved, and that a gravel road can require more of a base to support heavy fire equipment. Now, I know there's debate about, well, have we found, have we had a situation where emergency vehicles have sunk into the gravel road? And if we haven't, shouldn't we therefore not consider that to be an issue? Um, I think that, I, I guess the best way for me to conclude and to respond to the remark is the following. Um, the, the town manager in his, uh, what's already been mentioned, his uh, July 13, 1994 letter to Mr. Kennedy said that, um, you know, the only way the road could ever be fully open and paved would be through a vote of the town council and with a permit from the DEP. And I agree with that. And that's why we're here tonight. And I think it's impressive the number of people who are here tonight on both sides. I come from Yarmouth. We don't usually have, I'm not sure uh, in the on many years I've been in Yarmouth, we've ever had a, a session like this with this many people in attendance. So I think this is impressive and a credit to the town and to you. Um, Mr. McGovern went on to say, I do not foresee the town approaching the DEP unless there was some disaster and there was a huge public outcry to have the road opened up. Now, I think the number of people here tonight, the petitioners and everything else, is your outcry. What I would hate to see you do as members and representatives of the town is to wait for a disaster before deciding to at least take the step of allowing the planning board to review this and then allowing the DEP to review it. I can't sit here and guarantee you that the DEP would approve this, but if you don't ask, you'll never know. And I think that's really the decision for you tonight. Um, so I would conclude by urging you to allow the process to continue. These issues will be debated at the planning board and at the DEP, and that's fine. I, I welcome Mr. Kilber's participation there. He's an experienced environmental attorney. So am I, and ultimately let the DEP or the Board of Environmental Protection decide it. But I think that the rules have changed, the nature and circumstances out there have changed, and therefore it's time for the town to revisit the issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Ann Kaplan, and I'm standing here before you tonight to voice my opposition to the opening of Jordan Farm Road as a regular public throughway. I live at the corner of Winding Way and Jordan Farm Road since 1991. At the very corner, where traffic will increase the most should this occur. This move to make an open access road into the neighborhood will undermine months of work done in previous years that preserved critical wetlands, preserve the rural character of our town, and preserves the safety standards of our police and fire departments. That there are those who wish to destroy fragile wetlands because they perhaps did not consider the issue of traffic volume before they bought their homes is unfortunate. The town has visited this issue a number of times in the past, and the emergency access road was the result of a compromise between the town, the developer, and the Department of Environmental Protection, and the residents living adjacent to the road. The development of Broad Cove, which began in the 60s, has been a work in process since the original inception. It's now almost 40 years later, and the restrictions regarding wetlands and their uses has changed dramatically. The DEP has specified in several memos that there's a species of endangered plant that is on the state of Maine's guarded list living in the disputed area. 
It has also been noted that the area is important for migratory habits and breeding of several types of small animals and birds. One memo states, and I quote, the National Resources Protection Act requires that wetland impacts be avoided if at all possible and minimized wherever avoidance is not possible. Of course this can be avoided. We are avoiding impact right now and has been working well for several years. The emergency access road satisfies the town's need of safety for all 200 or so residents in the area, and the road is narrow enough and has little enough traffic not to disturb the environment through which it passes. Something that may have to be considered is that there may be no other way to create a permanent outlet today because of the current environmental standards. I also believe that this sudden outcry to open Jordan Farm Road is unwarranted. Since 1996, when the DEP outlined the reasons not to pave the road and the compromise was made to build the emergency access road, nothing has changed to put pressure on the DEP to change their ruling. Thirteen homes have been built since 1996, and these homes were taken into consideration when the DEP made their final recommendations to the developer. At the figure of 10 trips a day per household, or 130 additional trips, I think the decision in 96 was a good one because the increase in traffic is negligible compared to the total volume, which is somewhere in the vicinity of 14 to 1800 trips per day. If public opinion is your yardstick for proceeding with this issue, then I would like to point out that the petition used to bring this matter to the town council's attention is not an accurate survey of how all the residents are feeling. The bias of the people conducting the petition has infiltrated the results to make it meaningless. Several residents felt coerced by the interviewer. There are also several residents who signed that petition <coughs> not realizing that petitioning the DEP to remove wetland restrictions would be the ultimate result. These people would not sign that petition again. Moreover, the entire neighborhood was not approached and asked to sign. I was not asked to sign. From a statistical sampling point of view, you can't get an accurate estimate of opinion with a fair degree of confidence without including more residents. A false and misleading premise is that the res residents of Misty Lane, Ledgewood Lane, Spoondrift Lane are in any way affected by the amount of traffic that travels over Broad Cove Road, and yet their names make up the bulk of that petition. These people were used to skew the results in favor of the few who are bringing this issue to the forefront. In conclusion, the petition that was circulated is inaccurate, is misleading, and should be considered worthless as a guide for public opinion about the matter. Now, I was told when I purchased my property in June of 1991 that there would never be a through road running next to my house. It is no secret that real estate property value is based on location, and this proposal could neg negatively impact the market value of my house as traffic increases on my corner. I believe that to change the traffic pattern would probably have little impact on real estate value on Bralco Road and Salt Spray Lane, because even if traffic decreased by a third, no one would ever consider them to be a quiet street. Too many people still have to use these roads to access Channel View, Roundabout, Pine Ridge, and half of Hunts Point Road. I did a little experiment, and I timed myself driving from my house from both directions, using the intersection of Broad Cove Road and Route 77 as a starting point and observing posted speed limits. The difference in time to reach my house is about one minute and 20 seconds shorter if I were to use Jordan Farm Road. Then I thought about my usage of this road if it were to open. I figured that unless I were in a hurry, and I probably, I probably wouldn't use it much. I love waving my neighbors as I go by, and I love the views coming down Salt Spray Lane. I also love to run and ride my bike on the graveled road, as the area is a lovely piece of wilderness. I enjoy the pheasants, coyotes, and deer that live back there. It's painful to think that for the sake of convenience, and that is minimal at best, that in a few homeowners who are unhappy with the location of their recently purchased homes, that once again, a natural part of our world may be spoiled. An issue that's been brought up by the petitioners is the matter of speed in our neighborhood. And this really is a serious matter. And our neighborhood is not the only one in Cape Elizabeth that suffers from fast cars. If this road is, were open, it would have no effect on speeding. That is strictly a law enforcement issue. Finally, I'd like to add, as a taxpayer, I am not interested in having my tax dollars fund an expensive project that serves only a few residents. This project will require many months to get variances from the DEP. Adding to that is the expense of bringing the road up to code for such a usage. I cannot imagine that those living in other parts of Cape Elizabeth would be happy about such a project 
when the compromise solution that was reached several years ago is perfectly adequate. In conclusion, when doing a cost-benefit analysis, I would like to say that, in my opinion, to pursue Jordan Farm Road at the paved throughway is environmentally and fiscally irresponsible. Thank you. Uh, my name is Colleen Tainter, and I live at 6 Jordan Farm Road. Um, my address would probably clearly indicate to most of you how, how I feel about this issue. So in an effort to avoid redundancy, I just want to pre 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 present um, another petition that we conducted. Um, it serves simply to represent that we don't stand alone in our strong and obvious opposition to any changes to Jordan Farm Road. We haven't attempted to duplicate or compare. We just wanted to collect a sampling of people from the various affected neighborhoods. Um, included, you'll see um, some people who originally assigned the, um, uh, the original petition after they had a chance to examine um, documents and understand all the issues they have um, additionally signed the, um, this petition. So I'll just briefly read it, and then I'll present you with a copy. Um, it's a petition to maintain Jordan Farm Road as a limited emergency access way. We, the undersigned, respectfully request that the Town Council abide by previous decisions of the Town Planning Board and numerous rulings from the Department of Environmental Protection to maintain Jordan Farm Road as a limited access emergency way for the following reasons. There are four. The first is the two ponds and surrounding lands on Jordan Farm Road have been designated as a Class II wetland by the DEP and are fragile environmental assets of Cape Elizabeth. The wetland area in the Jordan Farm vicinity, the only open public green space in this section of Broad Cove, deserves to be protected as a valuable public asset that enhances the rural nature and scenic quality of all of, of Broad Cove, as well as neighboring areas. It is a well-used <coughs> pedestrian link. Third, the town manager has confirmed that Jordan Farm Road is fully functioning emergency access road that complies with the appropriate regulations and has been operational as such since the road has been under town supervision. And lastly, <clears throat> opening additional accesses into Broad Cove could have an impact on many contiguous neighbors in Shore Acres and in two lights that is not acceptable to them. So I will. Thank you very much. Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Steve Pelletier. Um, I'm the principal of Woodlot Alternatives out of Topsom, Maine. I'm a certified wildlife biologist. And a professional wetland scientist. Um, I've also prepared a few comments you might add to your list of paper. <laughs> to take a look at the well and to determine whether or not the possible opening of this road and repaving it would have an impact on the integrity of that wetland system. Um, part of my, my regular duties are to look at wetlands. We do conduct a lot of wetland delineations. We do what are known as wetland function analysis, where we'll look at how a wetland functions and what its values might be. And those are part of permitting processes, and it's a, it's a fairly specific process where you're looking at a lot of different ecological traits and blood flow functions and things like this. And, it's, and it is a, a, a process that, that's, uh, 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 that's fairly standard and uniform. Um, I went out there uh, and had a chance to take a look at this in, in, uh, a couple weeks ago. The wetland itself, is the, the road face itself is fairly stable. And um, right now, there isn't any active erosion issues or anything. The road base itself is is pretty well vegetated. Got quite a bit of grass is growing on it on the sides of it. Uh, the adjacent wetlands are, have a lot of uh, past uh, uh, disturbances from when, from the, obviously from the uh, the uh, agricultural days. Uh, the pond itself is probably an old farm pond. As you can see, the the, the side berms that. And um, you can see lots of uh, ditching in the wetland itself. And the, the, the point of, the, of, the well, of it is, is that it is a good wetland in terms of the ponds. It's a complex of different wetland community types that make one fairly nice wetland. At the same time, it's, it's bordered by some fairly thick shrub vegetation. And 
a lot of that vegetation is, a number of it is, is the in, invasive species that have moved in, both in the shrubs and in the pond, pond area itself. The, the actual um, impacts that could occur would, in my opinion, would be very minimal, would be very difficult to measure. Um, many of the, the actual direct impacts, if that occurred with the road basin expansion, if that had to occur, would be measured in um, what we would consider now uh, that the state would look at as a tier one permit activity and because it's a, a relatively small, um, a, a small number of square feet they actually required to be um, developed. It's, it's changed since the original. Some of the language that we've just heard here it used to be a class two. All that stuff has changed after 1995. We don't need to deal with that because that's not a town issue. But essentially, the, um, right now, the regulatory processes are different than they are. And they would be looking at, at first being able to avoid the impacts and then, of course, to minimize the impacts. And I think that the engineering hasn't even been looked at yet that, that could say, cannot this road be actually shifted more to the road to the north to further avoid any kind of impacts. If it does need to be uh, positioned, there would be a minor, a very minor impact that if it did have to go into wetlands, it would probably involve scrub shrub wetlands and there would be um, very little, a very immeasurable loss of, of habitat type. There's pretty concerns about what's living out there, who's doing what in terms of different species. Uh, concern about rare uh, species. Um, there was a fringe gentian that was observed, I guess, in the early 90s. That species has been taken off the list. It's no longer tracked by the Natural Areas Program because they recognize that it's, it's not, it's, it's, even, it's, it's a relatively uncommon species, but it's not a rare species. And, and so it's important to keep all of these things in, into, <coughs> into context. Um, this, the, uh, the wetland is a good wetland complex. It can handle the type of impacts that are going to be on because, um, and if, because of the type of vegetation that's actually there and the amount of actual water that's actually, uh, uh, that's, that's uh, uh, in that wetland um, at any one time during the year. The, um, the things that, that can be, is part of this thing is not just to say here's what it is, but if, but, but what the conditions are out there, but also perhaps to provide some recommendations for if this was, if this was to continue. And, and in, in my mind, I look at this as one of the things that we look at a lot of wetlands is, is uh, invasive species threat is, is something that's not really appreciated by most members of the public. And, and that's something that's, that's happening out there right now and it's probably more of a direct impact to the, the concerns of the wetland than, than most of us realize. The influences of the neighborhoods and stuff are also have impacts. Right now, if you were to go down in some of these wetlands and the ponds, you could see places where there's, there's trails down to them. Uh, there's one wet, one pond that's tucked in about 140 feet. That's the one that's to the farthest to the east, and it's actually a, a nice little uh, uh, place to sit down by the pond and take a look if you get a chance to go down in there. It's there's it's actually well used by by probably kids in the neighborhood. Um, the um, so those types of threats have a more immediate direct impact. Any kind of road impacts that would be associated would be indirect impacts, and those could be mitigated with the use of, of a good proper road barrier that could be put alongside that, that road if the road couldn't be moved farther to the north, be it actually a road barrier itself, and with additional plantings on the back side of that, you could actually enhance the, 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 the uh, wildlife capacity of, that, of the area. You can en enhance the actual aesthetic values of this you could enhance the erosion control functions. Those erosion control functions are already well in place with the type of vegetation that's already there. But in summary, I would encourage you to read this thing. Um, it's the, it is a nice wetland. wetland uh, and the, the regulatory processes require that you avoid and minimize. I believe that those processes can be followed, that if you couldn't avoid, that there'd be a very minimal impact, that they'd be very difficult to measure that. Um, our function value assessment would show that you would not have any real impacts to any one of the, the, of the major functions that we're concerned about. On top of that, there are ways to mitigate potential threats through the use of road barriers and with extra plantings. If there's any questions, I could, I'd be happy to answer, if I could. There, there may well be some questions. Um, if, are you going to stay here? 
if I have to. Yes, you might have questions then. Thank you very much. Donna Sterling, 52 Broad Cove Road. First thing I would like to say is something in respect to our being grandfathered in, the, in Broad Cove, that that's why we only are allowed to have our one road, regardless of whatever issues there are. I would just like to say, I hope that no, nobody here feels like quality of life, as specified in the planning ordinances, is grandfathered. Our quality of life should not, be ha should not have to be considered grandfathered at the expense of our safety. <coughs> Excuse me. The question is, can we, or are we responsible for it? Are we responsible? The people who do not live on Broad Cove Road, Salt Spray, or any other direct artery, to any of you, I should like to request that in the interest of our safety, you defer from judging that which is menacing for us and does not directly affect your safety. I have four little grandsons, very little. They cannot play in my yard. My husband cannot mow the grass unless it's in the evening when the tractor is, low, is down because it's so dangerous for him to be beside the edge of the road. That's just an aside. I hope the peril of our children and all Broad Cove residents is everyone's concern. The dangerous nature of channeling all the traffic for over 200 homes through this one opening clearly speaks for itself. Please remember, we're talking about over a quarter of a million cars. The validity of the issue concerning whether another road will reduce speed is transparent. If half the traffic has the opportunity to use a closer road on which to enter or exit, our risk factor for danger is significantly diminished. The school bus is just but one example, never mind all the other things that have to come down, all the service vehicles which come down, do their jobs for all of you, maybe even some of you who can't go through because you're on the journey on this road. But they have to turn around and come back by us another time, back, my, back by my little boy's foreign car. <coughs> Our unique character suffers by the continuing issuance of building permits for this neighborhood with no consideration for the safety <coughs> of the existing residents. Thank you. Hi, my name is Trish Wasserman. <coughs> Excuse my voice. I live at Three Running Tide Road. And um, I'm opposed to paving the road and opening it as a full access road for a number of reasons. But what I'd like to talk to everyone tonight about are the wetlands. And I'm not an expert. I, I don't want to present myself as such. We had an expert here. But I do have an appreciation of them. And I think that probably most of us in Cape Elizabeth do. And in fact, it's one of the reasons why I'm glad I live here, because I think that we have a strong commitment in the town to environmental issues, to preserving beautiful lands, natural resources, and functional resources that we use. We see it every day in Cape. We see it every day in how we enjoy and use our assets. We see it in things like the comprehensive plan, which a lot of you people have worked on. And one of the things that I will point out, because someone else will be discussing this, is that one of, the, one of the things that has been highlighted as being one of the values of our neighborhoods are the wetland issues, and that one of the things we have to do to help repair some of the damage done by some of the the building that's gone over in 40 years is to preserve what we have left. We can't go back, but we can preserve what we have left. So that's something I'd like to point out. These principles are also very much in line with the current state planning board issues. Evan Reichert and his crew have their smart growth policies to contain sprawl. They advocate wise development, but in tandem with conservation of our natural resources. And that's why I'm here to talk, and what I'd like to talk about tonight is just sticking to the wetland issue about it. And um, I think one of the things I'd love to invite people to do is to come down and see the wetlands because they really are beautiful. And again, I'm not an expert. I don't want to pretend to be. 
but they are beautiful. And I brought some pictures, I think the council has them. Here's an example of one of the ponds that they're talking about. My kids call it Harold's Pond, and they are one of the kids that play down there sometimes. You know, there are, there are several ponds back there that, are, that are an issue. Would you I'd like to see it? Sure. You, you should try and keep your voice toward the mic so the TV audience can hear you. Surely, Thank I'm you. sorry. I just feel it's like hard. I see my neighbors. When you're going back and forth, it's hard, you know. Because um, they were neighbors. Um, and, this is, but I, I, and with all due respect to all of the issues, I, I try to drive as slowly as I can. I try to be as respectful as I can. I try to limit and carpool and do everything I can. Because that's my concern, too. Your quality of life is my concern. And that's why I invite you to look at these wetlands that you have in Broad Cove area. Over off of Broad Cove, they're beautiful and they're functional and they're important. And so is the one on our side of the development as well. It serves some very important uh, roles that I believe they do. And again, I'm not an expert, but I think that this is, it makes sense. What's the big deal about wetlands? Well, as the experts shown, they're one of the most biologically productive natural ecosystems we have in the world. They're home or habitat to a wide variety of plants and animals. And they're a critical seasonal habitat for migratory birds, animals. They have food, water, and cover for these, these critters up and down the coast. And they're beautiful. These pictures are stunning. We have them all around us. They're gorgeous. Um, but aside from that, I know that's not everybody's concern. You know, looks aren't everything. On a very practical note, wetlands tremendously influence the flow of water in our neighborhood. They're really important. Um, and, and for many, I think that may be one of the most practical reasons why. We're creatures, we're the species probably who benefit the most from the wetlands and from preserving them, probably because of how they affect our water. They're sponges. Wetlands are natural tubs. They absorb and retain water. We have storm gales coming in. We have tons of water pouring down. The wetlands in our neighborhood are what pro are protecting our homes from flooding. They buffer in the rate and the volume of stormwater and flood dispersion. I think in Broad Cove on the road and, and on Salt Spray, for example, that critical wetland, and I asked them to bring the map up so you could see there's a huge band of wetland right behind Broad Cove. That's the tub that's keeping salt spray from flooding out. When they paved the church a few extra feet, they started to notice more flooding on salt spray. Small pavement surfaces can, if they're placed certain ways, have a critical impact and can <coughs> cause flooding that I think none of us would like to see and could be a safety issue. On the southerly side, on the Jordan Farm side, those wetlands protect the people who live on my side of the development, and also people in Hannaford Cove, and on the other two light side. They're an important water moderating body for us. And no matter what wetland you're in, and no matter how far away, when you're on the coast, water coming down, the wetlands are protecting your front, you know, oceanfront homes from erosion as well, from fresh water dispersion down there. So I think that they make a lot of sense to preserve. They're not just good looking, but they do a lot of hard work for us too. Um, Again, I, I don't want to pres present myself as being an expert, but why is paving an issue? You hear a lot of opinions why it may be important or may not make a difference. And the wetlands heard a lot of those, uh, the DEP heard a lot of those opinions back when they were looking at these issues in the past. They've considered that, and in the end, they made their ruling saying this particular wetland should be preserved and should be preserved by not paving the road. And they did revisit that issue, and they came to the same conclusion. We don't, again, we don't have a, a wetland expert here, but we did consult with somebody who many of you know. He was the uh, vice president and former provost at USM, and he happens to be an internationally known expert on rural development and urban, urban planning. His name is Dr. Mark Laffing. He came out with his hip boots and poked around as well. By the way, he complimented our town planner, so I think she's excellent. So that's it. I had to get that plug in for Maureen. But he did come out to Jordan for a moment. He pr we wanted a reality check. Well, we. Was this foolish of us to pursue this? I mean, there are a lot of issues at stake here. Are these wetlands important at all or not? Are these road issues real issues or not? And um, he walked the land with us, and he showed us what was going on. I brought a few more pictures just for people who may not know what the neighborhood looks like on that side. Again, I invite you to come down. I'd love to walk the road with you. Um, one of the things that you'll see when you come down, if you're driving your car, and I'll show all of you, is this picture which is the far entrance. It's a big deal at the gravel road. Yeah, it looks like trees. We see this all the time. Mm -hmm. Down here is where the gate that they're talking about is these chains. Here's a runner. This is somebody who lives on Salt Spray who runs on this road. You see that all the time, too, and we're glad people can use it and enjoy it. So this is what it looks like, and you think, big deal. But um, here's another view of one of the ponds they're talking about. That's what the runner saw, this pond here. And this is the drainage ditch that they had to put in underneath it to, um, when they were putting this road in. It's about 10 to 12 feet from where the road ends. But that's one of the ponds, one of these beautiful ponds I was showing you pictures of. 
And that's just, again, so for people, come down and look at it and see it, you know, judge it for yourself. It's true we have invasive plants. I mean, ultimately, these formlands are going to be reforested down the pike. More pictures in general of what it looks like on the other side, the side you wouldn't see from the road again as well. And here's a picture, another one. I love this land. I'm out there. But you can see tracks, animal tracks. We have moose back there who use the ponds, other animals, and water tracks that you just see pouring into the backside of these ponds. This is what the moose is looking for. He's trying to get in there to one of those ponds. And uh, finally, you know, again, beautiful pictures. Take a look. Come down in person and take a look. And you have the same thing on Broad Cove and your wetlands on that side as well. It's just a lovely, lovely area that I think is worth preserving. And Dr. Lapping agreed with us. He came out, put on his boots, walked the road, looked at the land, went over some important, really important soil issues that we do need to consider too about whether you can put a road there. And my neighbor's going to talk about that. He's much more of an expert on that. But when he did all that, checked all these things, brought his soil maps, brought his conservation maps, his planning books and all of those things, he said, okay, are we being foolish or not? He said, you know, it's, this, is, this road surface is really, uns this is an unsuitable land for building a road. It's ledge, it's got very tr tremendously poor quality soil, it's not going to sustain it, you're going to get into more building than you think, you know, blah, blah, blah. He confirmed that the DEP P appeared to be on solid ground in their previous rulings. He pointed out that we'd likely be faced with significant flooding, septic, and surface water issues should the road be paved. And he reminded us that we have an irreplaceable jewel in our neighborhood, that opening this road as a through road is a, is a valuable asset. It doesn't solve our traffic issues. Someone else is going to talk about that, too. He points out more roads don't mean less traffic. They mean, in fact, an increase overall in volume. And someone else will talk about that. So at that expense, are we really going to solve the traffic problem? That urban planner doesn't think so. An urban rural planner, he's both. Excuse me, could you try to yeah. summarize your up into eight minutes? So, sorry. You. But I do believe, um, I firmly believe that the DEP have approached to stand firm. They'll, they're not going to be happy that we're coming back to them. We have, uh, our attorney's going to address that as well um, with the alterations. They're pretty significant. If they go with the plan that you have, we are talking about possible fill of greater than 15,000 square feet, which throws it to an EPA level 404 permit. You know, the EPA gets involved when you fill more than 15,000 square feet, and that's what paving that, that amount of fill would require. So that's going to be another issue to consider. And I think all in, in all, we're, bar we're, we're looking at something, and we have to really know what we're looking at, what we're bargaining for. I think in the end, we'd be glad if we didn't pave it for all those other issues. Thank you for your time. I'm sorry I went over. Thank you. My name is uh, Anton, Anton Ward. I live at 36 Two Lights Road. And uh, with some of my neighbors, I want to draw the uh, attention of the council to some issues on the comparative issues between Two Lights Road and uh, Broad Cove Road that haven't yet been addressed, I think, tonight. And I want to begin by expressing the hope that when all is said and done, many in Broad Cove may actually decide that the overall cause of public safety in our town will be served best by not introducing another 600 cars a day to Two Lights Road. Likewise, a 1.7-mile dead-end street, it already carries nearly as much residential traffic as Broad Cove Road does, but has the further assignment of bringing a huge non-resident public to spectacular sites <coughs> on the at open Atlantic. It's really our premier town road to the open ocean. For everyone, whether they live in, uh, on Two Lights Road already or come from neighborhoods like Broad Cove, Development has essentially ended in Broad Cove. The neighborhood is now complete, at least in fulfillment of what was expected in 1990. There have been no surprises, really. It can grow no further. In contrast, the residential area served by Two Lights Road will almost certainly continue to grow to some extent, as well as will main tourism. For both roads, the heaviest traffic, the most onerous traffic, falls on an initial trunk line, so to speak, of about half a mile before volume eases. Broad Cove Road carries its maximum flow past 25 driveways before losing about one-sixth of it at Ledgewood Lane. And Two Lights Road carries its full traffic, its fullest load of traffic past 23 driveways before giving up some of its flow to Hannaford Cove Road. But I must point out that one of these driveways also happens to be the entrance to a school attended by 20 small children. The town's just completed count of traffic on these sections of both roads has registered roughly 2,000 cars a day for each. 
specifically a daily average of 1,870 on Broad Cove Road, just below the church, and 2,111 on two lights just above Jordan Farms Road. For two lights, the count was compromised, of course, by being taken in the off season, the slow tourist season. But, it also, but, but also it was distorted, it should be noted, by placement of the counter where it failed to capture the traffic associated with the first 18 houses on the road, not to mention the school. It's easy to correct for that placement, of course, simply by applying the standard of eight trips per day per household that is reflected in the Broad Cove count, and thus predicting that the tally would increase by 144 for the 18 uncounted households, as well as by another 80 on school days for the two in, two out, times 20 parental deliveries, or trips to take and fetch, to fetch and retreat. If these, <laughs> with these additions, the corrected daily average becomes 2,312 for two lights in, in comparison to 1,870 for Broad Cove. Both tallies include no traffic associated with St. Bartholomew's, which has entrances on each road. How would these figures change if Jordan Farms were open? If we draw an imaginary line, as it has actually, actually been drawn in various ways, either here perhaps, uh, I drew it here because psychologically I think if I lived this side of a line, I would tend to come out this way. If we drew a line there, we, we would have 75 houses that lie beyond it and would probably choose to come and go via Jordan Farms Road. We, could predi we can predict a, re a reduction, therefore, of 600 cars a day from the 1870 or so on the first half mile of Broad Cove Road and a corresponding increase of 600 to the 223, 35 or so on the first half mile of Two Lights Road. In short, opening Jordan Farms to Regular traffic would change what has been a situation of relative parity between the most traveled sections of both neighborhoods to a situation of gross disparity. Fewer than 1,300 vehicles a day on Broad Cove Road versus nearly 3,000 a day on Two Lights Road, a difference of more than two to one. Most of us think that few cars would actually make the zigzag and go down Fessenden and, uh, and Kettle Cove Roads just because uh, it's out of the way for them. Although if many did, it would raise new traffic issues in another densely populated neighborhood, heavily traveled by non-residents. And then very quickly, simply because public access to the Atlantic Ocean lies at the end of Two Lights Road, it will always remain one of the town's main avenues for walkers, runners, rollbladers, and cyclists. Anyone who has walked the circuit of Two Lights, Broad Cove, Jordan Farm, can assess that there is no comparison between the peril a pedestrian feels on two lights and the relative sense of safety one feels anywhere in Broad Cove, even in the busy busiest stretch. <clears throat> the problem on two lights stems not just from the added speed and volume of traffic, but also from shoulders of gravel guaranteed to dump a bicycle that slips <coughs> off the edge, an uninterrupted straightaway that invites speeding and at the end of the straightaway, the challenge for everyone suddenly to thread the needle together as the road simultaneously curves and climbs past four blind driveways. So I urge the council to do all it can to enhance safety in Broad Cove. But to do so in a way, if possible, it will not direct another 600 cars a day onto a road which, because of its special role in the town for a wider public, should be protected from large, avoidable, infusions of new residential traffic. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jim Wasserman, Trisha's husband, or the other guy who's going to talk about traffic, as she said. <laughs> um, I just wanted to make one point while I was standing here. Development, you know, is forever. I've never seen anything undeveloped. And once a road is built, you get into what's called creeping sprawl or sprawl. A road leads to houses, houses lead to more roads. And with that being said, uh, it's a little bit ironic that this whole issue has an allowed me or enabled me to meet more neighbors than I've ever met <laughs> in, eight to t in about coming up on 10 years since I've lived here. And one of the reasons I don't think I meet my neighbors is we live in a car culture, as everyone's talked about, and it's very hot. Car culture, warming of the environment, fat kids, fat people. And it gets down to the fact that there are too many cars. 
And I feel, excuse the expression, I feel the pain of everyone in Broad Cove. But I think their, their solution is misguided. And I think their solution is misguided for the following fact. More roads make more cars. It's proven time and time again. And I have some references with me. The first is the most enjoyable to read, and it's a thick book, but a great read. It's called The Power Broker by Pulitzer Prize winner Robert Cairo. It's over 1,500 pages long, and it's about Robert Moses, the, most, the biggest and most prestigious builder who ever lived, more than Pharaoh, more than Charlemagne, more than anyone. He built every road in New York. There's more concrete in the Triborough Bridge than all the pyramids combined. The more roads he built in New York, the more cars came. And if anyone has ever drawn out, drove, driven out on Long Island, this is what you see. And you say, oh, but this road's not going to be like that. More roads make more cars. <laughs> I have more boring books to read, but nonetheless, just as effective. The, trans the Transportation Use Connection, Terry Moore and Paul Thornis, in Transportation and Land Use Innovations, primers at our university, our University of Southern Maine, taught by the same professor my wife, Tricia, talked about. Dr. Mark Lapping, L-A-P-P-I-N-G, a renowned international expert on rural development and, develop and urban development. Well, I should add, was asked to come to Estonia recently to decide how the land should be given back to the people after the Soviet Union fell. He walked the land, as Tricia said, he agreed. More roads make more cars. So having said that, what do I think the solution is? <laughs> this is the solution. <laughs> now, some people think I'm impractical. Wait, wait, wait. Everyone had a chance to speak. I will speak. I ride my bike to work every day from April until December, and I ride it back. I am careful, and I ride. I see walkers on the road in the morning. When I leave, I see them when I get back. I have convinced one other person in Broad Cove to ride to work in all the years that I have lived here. You say, well, I can't ride to work. I can't walk. I have to drive to the other end. I have to drop my kids off. If people want it, there is a solution. And I say to the people of Broad Cove and Cape Elizabeth, as I said to Osher Kramer in my kitchen, you have a chance to make history here, not just to make another road, not to pave over wetlands, not to make more cars, but to demonstrate to uh, southern Maine and Maine and the rest of the country there are solutions to traffic other than just making more roads and driving more cars. I feel badly about the cars, but if enough people felt badly about it and they carpooled or they rode their bikes or they walked or they didn't get their teenage kids three or four cars, I don't think you'd have this problem with 250,000 cars per day. That being said. So, what are the advantages of a road? From my perspective, I don't see any. There will be more traffic eventually in Broad Cove. It's written time and time again in every traffic manual ever written. You think there'll be less traffic, there'll be more. There'll be more lawn-cutting trucks, more business trucks coming down the road from two lights into Broad Cove than before. There won't be less traffic. I don't see any advantages. Initially, there may be less traffic going out through the main egress, but eventually there won't be any more. What are the advantages of not building a road? Exercise, decreasing global warming, improving the environment, saving two ponds that are there, saving a wetlands that, is, that are there, and leaving a lasting legacy to children other than just paving the whole world over. I want to make one final point, and this is something I take a little bit of umbrage at. I've been told by the proponents of this proposal, as well as other people, that I'm living at their expense, that I have a piece of paradise where I live, and they don't have that. I look out my back, and I see wetlands, and I don't see that much traffic. I'm not living at anyone's expense, and I'm not driving past you most of the time. I'm riding my bike, and I'm walking, and I'm taking less car trips. Yes, I have paradise, but it takes work to keep a paradise. It doesn't take any work to pave a road. And once you pave a road, you can't unpave it. It's done, it's gone forever. And I will quote someone who's a famous Canadian, not an American. Let's not pave paradise and put up a parking lot. Thank you. I'm Frank Levitt. I live at One Running Tide Road. 
And uh, one of my students came up to me one day and said, hey, Mr. Levitt, did you hear about the big earthquake out in California? I said, geez, no, John, I didn't hear about it. He said, I, I think it was around a 6.8. Boy, isn't that terrible? I said, well, well, John, it's not terrible to the earthquake. And then he said, yeah, but Mr. Levitt, that's a great natural, a great natural disaster. I said, John, it isn't a natural disaster. It is, it is to you, it is to the people, but to the earthquake and to the earth, it's a natural occurrence. And that's what our, that's, that's what our woodlands, our wetlands are. They're a natural occurrence. And we lose those, we lose those wetlands with that road going to, if it's really at specs, it's 34 feet. It's adding another, what, 18, 16 feet to the road. That dirt road right now, uh, down by what I call the little pond, which is out towards Two Lights End, is roughly two feet the water level is roughly two feet below grade level. Now back when that road went through with the wagon, whoever owned the farm, was probably just about at that, at that level, just above the water level. When we first looked at the road back in 91, uh, it was two tracks that a vehicle could get through, you know, with grass in between. Uh, you, you probably wouldn't need a four-wheel drive, you could use a good pickup. But it, it, it's a leftover from the old days and the new graded road. Uh, if you get just past where the pond is, uh, is maybe two or three feet above uh, where the water table is. And maybe to give you a little bit of background, <coughs> uh, this is Jordan Farm Road. I don't know how many of you can see it. Uh, but but <coughs> the land here is a one-time event not just in our lives, but, but in the future, our children's lives. The town owns, fortunately, this, this uh, darker green because the developer here said, made, made a trade. So he made a trade, he couldn't build on this land anyway because it's all swamp land. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a land with, uh, with the, the wetland because in this area, you have outcrops of our, our typical ledge uh, that you find out in, in this area. Uh, the, <coughs> over the outcrops of ledge is very thin soil, and uh, the soil that's there is of a soil type where the movement of the water is somewhere about 6.3 inches uh, per hour, which is pretty good. Not, uh, it, not terribly impermeable, it's, it's permeable. <clears throat> Where the road is going along here, uh, I'll give you a little description, I'll have to read it in my notes, but where the road is going here, it's a, it's a different kind of soil formation. It's a soil formation that, let me catch, I think I have my notes, Jim. It's a soil formation. <clears throat> I got this incidentally out of the Cumberland County Soil Survey. Uh, not new, 1974, but I suspect it isn't updated. And, and where the road goes now, uh, this is what they say about it. It consists of sand, sandy loam, stony, if you've gone up to see the new digging up there, the new house, it's certainly a stony soil. Uh, the, it, it can be clayey. It has variable permeability. Uh, some of the some of it is fairly impermeable, where the water flows through at about two tenths of an inch per hour, uh, meaning that it's probably fairly clayey. The, <coughs> where the road goes in this this soil formation, this kind of soil, it's uh, said to for highways is susceptible to frost heaves, uh, and uh, one of the situations that they mentioned in the book that it has very severe limitations to develop various kinds of developments due to the high water table and excessive surface water. Keeping these features in mind when considering the impact of runoff from the addition of a paved road, I, now the wetland is because of the runoff here and the soil down here where the swamps are has clay which is holding the water, keeping the holding the water table up 
We're adding to this a paved road with, uh, if it goes to specs, with shoulders, a sidewalk, being 34 feet wide. If we go to specs, yes, that's true, ma'am, if you read the letter. Excuse me, I don't want to drive a road with anything like that. Well, Excuse I'm me. telling you what the specs say for this road. <laughs> and the runoff on that side, even with good drainage, you know there will be runoff of uh, debris from vehicles, uh, effluent from vehicles, which will be getting into those wetlands, will be flowing into our little pond, will be flowing into the, the uh, what we call the skating pond, Jim called it, what, uh, yeah, whole pond? Harold's pond. Harold's pond. And the, certainly the vegetation in the area will be affected and impacted. Obviously I'm speaking in favor of uh, this road that if, if before the planners decided to build houses in the Broad Cove area, they probably said, let's put a road through such and such and so on. That area where this road you want to pave probably would not be selected as one of the roads. Thank you. I might say that you could direct your comments to the council so that we don't get into debates here. <laughs> My name is Jane Sneerson, and I live at 7 Salt Spray Lane, which is the corner of Broad Cove and Salt Spray. And I thank all of you who wave to me when you go by. <laughs> um, I have great respect for the neighbors and for the neighborhood and for the council, and I appreciate the efforts on our behalf that all of you have placed. I have a very little sketch what I would like to deal with is the human element here. I've heard a great deal about roads and land use and traffic. What I haven't heard too much about are the people who are affected by this. As I say, I live on the corner. Several times a year, the corner of Broad Cove and Salt Spray collects water. And nobody's ever sure how much water there is. So on occasion, this white area being my house, on occasion, people cut across the corner. <laughs> and every year, the gardener comes around in the spring and he fluffs up the mud and the grass and you know, so forth. A year and a half ago, there was a major flood at the corner. Stanley Sants was dispensed to the corner with his Jeep to prevent traffic from going through. It was yay deep. We could catch trout, I think. There was no sign at 77 advising people on their way in that the road was closed. So they came down to Broad Cove Road to the corner and then had to turn around and go back, uh, which created its own hazard. There was no warning coming from further than my house, coming down Salt Spray to try and make that corner. There was no notice, there was no barricade for a long time saying that the road was flooded. One person was terribly impatient. She went around this side of my house. Okay, this is salt spray where the little creek is. Okay, she went around this side. Uh, fortunately, it's all very funny, except she could have fallen into the creek. She had a Jeep type vehicle, which was probably good for her. It did not tip over. She did not fall into the creek. She did not hit my house or my trees or my generator, or anybody who might have been on the far side of my house out of her vision until she went tearing around. Um, the point of the story is there are people involved here, and people, I fear, will be hurt. My issue is the safety. If, God forbid, there was an emergency and vehicles could not get beyond my house or to my house, I think it would be a crime I don't want a disaster to happen. I understand the, the issues with property and with values and with wetlands and with scenery. I would hope that the town and its residents would put human life first. Thank you. My name is Elizabeth McGrath and I live at Six Winding Way. Jordan Farm Road is, obviously, many things to many people. 
And in a society where we all spend so much time in our cars, and our trucks, and our SUVs, Jordan Farm Road may look like just another dirt road that should be paved over and opened up. To many people, Jordan Farm Road would be an easy way to disperse neighborhood traffic, and to others, it would be a more convenient route in and out of the neighborhood. But Jordan Farm Road is much more than just a potential through access for Broad Cove. <clears throat> I am very passionate about Jordan Farm Road. To me, it is just as much a defining feature of our neighborhood as our beaches and our shore access. I spend from one to three hours walking outside every day of the year, and I am well acquainted with the roads, trails, and hidden pathways of our town. This is why I so appreciate and value what a truly unique and special place Jordan Farm Road is. Jordan Farm Road is a wonderful pedestrian access way that serves as a gateway to the Crescent Beach and Two Lights areas. It is a public green space that is used daily by residents of Broad Cove, Shore Acres, and the Two Lights area. It serves as an important link between the residential areas and public parks in the town, and it helps to define the rural character of the southern portion of Cape Elizabeth. Jordan Farm Road and its adjacent wetlands are vital and defining features of the local landscape. Jordan Farm Road is used daily by walkers, joggers, runners, and cyclists. It is a wonderfully safe place where children can ride their bikes, play ball in the middle of the road, and explore the edges of the pond. It is an important scenic asset of the town, filled with wildflowers from early spring to late fall. And it is a haven for wildlife, where one can see fox and rabbits, pheasants, great blue herons, the occasional moose. This beautiful wetland with its pedestrian access is a valuable asset that should be treasured and preserved. To any residents not familiar with Jordan Farm Road, I invite you to come and explore this special place for yourselves. Please get out of your car. Come on foot or come on your bike, but please come and see this wonderful green space we are so fortunate to have. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Steve Blumenthal. I've been a resident in the Broad Cove area for the past 10 years. Um, originally, I lived on uh, Hunts Point Road. I, I don't have anything really materially to say differently, but I just want to give my perspective. I originally lived on, uh, on Hunts Point Road, and, and I know and can uh, empathize with road rage. Um, I have a couple of road rage stories. Living on Hunts Point Road and uh, somebody zipping down there a good 50 miles an hour and running after them, uh, either running <laughs> with my legs, biking after them, catching up to people, uh, teenagers often. Uh, it happens everywhere and uh, it should be permitted um, and, and needs to be looked at closely throughout the entire neighborhood. Also in solidarity with my uh, uh, neighbors on Broad Cove Road. Um, I drive 25 miles an hour down that road. I am tailgated at times, and uh, I'm slowing people down, so maybe they want me to keep driving along there. Um, but in, in any case, I moved to uh, um, Jordan Farm Road uh, about a year and a half ago. We moved in, and uh, we, we love it there. And when we, when, uh, we just recently heard about the uh, petition from the Broad Cove people, I, I was pretty upset. Um, and I thought that, again, my little bit of paradise there was, was going to disappear. And, and I've been heartened by uh, the fact that, uh, um, as you're seeing tonight, it's not a unanimous opinion of the, uh, of the neighborhood that this road must go through. There are people from various areas, uh, not just concentrated on, on my, my road. Most of the people who've spoken tonight are not right on my road. Um, so it's, it's not by any means unanimous. Um, I've spoken to one of my colleagues who uh, after he signed it, he told me point blank, <coughs> he wouldn't have signed it if he knew what it meant, um, uh, the, the, the original petition from Broad Cove area. I don't know, again, details of all the numbers of people who've signed, but I wonder how fair it is. Um, but I've been encouraged by the number of other people who have uh, come forward to say that this is just not a good idea for our community. Um, uh, unlike uh, previous uh, thoughts on the issue, when I had spoken to Mr. McGovern years ago before we uh, purchased the property, he had told us that if, if, uh, if he felt that the, uh, uh, the road, you know, emergency roads don't work, but he has since told me that they do work, and, and, and this one is working um, as it is now. Um, I had some notes that I was going to say about, you know, now, now that I'm living there, just how, how gorgeous it is. And these things have been said already by a lot of people in, in my neighborhood, not just on my block. I'm lucky because I get to see it all the time, and it's a real joy. And I get to see people walking by, uh, uh, riding their bikes, jogging, et cetera. And uh, I think they'll really miss something. 
Um, my only thought about it is that when I, when I walk down Fessenden Street with, with my kids to go over to the ice cream place, I'm always looking everywhere for, uh, for cars, and I have a feeling that we'll turn the, the, the beautiful road we have now into the equivalent of, of Fessenden, where I, I kind of have to look where I'm going, and, and cars will, will zip through, um, and it's dangerous for the kids. I've got four young kids. I, I treasure their safety, and I realize everyone treasures their children's safety as well. Um, but we all treasure that part of uh, Cape, and I think to, uh, um, to pave that road is to really put an end to, uh, to a really gorgeous area that is really for all of us in, in Broad Cove, not just for a few people on that road. So I would encourage the, uh, the council to uh, consider that strongly. And one last thing is my kids just recently saw a bobcat on our road, which is first item. <coughs> Good evening, Chairman Carson, uh, members Good of the evening. Uh, my name is Jamie Kilbrook. I'm representing the uh, opponents to the proposal. Uh, and I obviously um, cannot speak to not living in the neighborhood uh, the points a number of people have made. But I would like to talk about three things that I, I do think are quite important in your consideration of this issue. Um, as an aside, I note that uh, this is probably the uh, most interested gathering of citizens anywhere in the country except Palm Beach. <laughs> um, and it's quite a testament to uh, Cape Elizabeth that so many people are here and having a civil dialogue about a, a, an issue like this. Um, the, the first point I want to make goes back to what uh, Jeff Thaler, actually, and Steve Pelletier were talking about when they talked about how you think about wetlands. Um, Steve mentioned avoidance, and, and I think that's a critical concept here. The, the test is, when you look at what the purpose of the project is, is there a way you can achieve the purpose without filling or affecting the wetlands? Um, what you've heard tonight is a lot of discussion about safety, traffic, uh, and those kinds of concerns, and, and I don't mean to denigrate them in the least. The, the question is, is the only way you can address them by opening up this road and filling wetlands? Uh, and I think, as uh, the memo from the town manager suggests, there are obviously other ways of getting at that problem, uh, such as the, what Prouse Neck does. Uh, you can beef up the patrolling of the area. You can enforce the speed limit more rigorously. You can consider speed bumps. There are a range of alternatives here, any one of which effectively precludes the department from authorizing you to fill these wetlands. Um, so I'd say that even without the fact that there's an existing permit, which I'll come to in a minute, in order to do this, uh, there are some substantial hurdles that would have to be uh, left. And I don't see that you can make the initial showing of avoidance based on the purpose of the project that's required here. The second point related to that, though, is uh, you're not writing against a clean slate. Uh, the department has made findings and has issued a permit here. So from a policy point of view, you'd be going back to the department and asking them to essentially reconsider the very arguments they rejected 10 years ago. Uh, and I think if you looked at the memo uh, that was in the file and was attached to the petitions I saw, all of these safety issues are discussed. They were considered by the department at the time that permit was issued in 1990 and 1991. And the department determined that the wetlands were too significant to justify the kinds of impacts they'd suffer if you made that a through road. Um, so if people objected to that, the time to challenge that decision was back then. There's a permit. If you disagree with it, you're supposed to bring an appeal. You're not supposed to come back 10 years after the fact and say, by the way, we want to revisit that issue that you've already decided. So I think from a policy point of view, uh, you're asking the department to do something that would be very difficult. In, in essence, you're saying that whenever a developer or a town or somebody decides long after the fact they want to come in and change something, uh, that's okay. Now, if the circumstances had changed radically, it might be okay. Uh, but the problem is there's no change in circumstance here. Uh, sure, there's traffic. But the development, the, the example Mr. Thaler talked about, well, there's another house on Jordan Farm Road. 
that house was part of the subdivision plan that was approved at the time the decision not to pave the road was made. That's not a change in circumstance that justifies paving the road now. So I think you're really creating, uh, in the absence of some change in circumstances, and given the availability of alternatives to address the problem that people have identified tonight, you have a virtually impossible task at the department. Now, I do agree with Mr. Thaler that uh, neither of us can predict exactly what the department would do, uh, but I think it's fair to say that identifying these issues and litigating them through the process at the DEP would take a long time and be quite expensive uh, with a very uncertain outcome. And it would be far more expensive uh, and take more time than implementing a number of the other measures that are available to you right now. The last point I want to make is uh, I, I think there's another fundamental problem that, that is implicated by this proposal. Uh, in the DEP permits, a number of the lot owners uh, have their property encumbered by deed restrictions. The deed restrictions are premised on this not being a through road. So at the time when those people bought their property, they're buying on a town approved, a DEP approved subdivision, which says this is not a through road. For the council to go ahead and change that now, could impact their property values. Uh, and that might be something the town would have to pay for. So I think when you put all those things together, uh, it makes a lot more sense to address this problem uh, with, I think it was option A, I don't remember in the memo from the manager, but no, it was B maybe, it was anyway. Uh, talk about doing something like Prout's Neck, develop a fund, uh, and it, you know they pay for that in Prout's Neck, and you could probably do a combination of town and, and neighborhood uh, funding, but have some rigorous enforcement of the traffic uh, laws. Put in speed bumps. Do those kinds of things uh, to address this problem of safety uh, and leave the wetlands alone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chairman Carson, Chairperson Carson and Council, good evening. I'm um, Louise Sullivan. I live at 72 Two Lights Road. Um, and I am here to not add measurably to all the things that have been said, but to just remind you a little bit about the comprehensive plan that was adopted in 1993 and also to present you with a, another petition from Two Lights, Fessenden, and Kettle Cove Road, adding to the petition that Colleen Tainter presented from um, part of Jordan Farm and part of Broad Cove of about 60 signatures. Um, the comprehensive plan, which as, I mean, the first time I was aware of it was about 1981. Its final form has come to us in, uh, in, in the plan we have now in 1993, and it is an amazing, it's an amazing document with high thoughts for this town. Um, and um, it's a document that has a vision of coexistence and appreciation of the gifts that we have here, the gifts of natural beauty, the wild and rural character of our town, and the historic evidence of the historic past. Um, it also has um, a vision of cooperation and friendly living. For example, in the introduction, the first point, it says, there's a strong community consensus that the town should take all reasonable steps to preserve the rural character of Cape Elizabeth. In this context, rural refers to the appearance of the countryside, its open space, and its lack of intense commercial development, rather than a stereotypical way of life. And to me, a stereotypical way of life is suburban and tons of cars. Um, this comprehensive plan offered another vision for that. And many of the points in the comprehensive plan are ones that we're doing. We're actually Im implementing this plan here in our town. I would just like to say that this plan calls for the area that we're discussing tonight, calls that 
a zoned resource protection area for wetland. It's shown on the map down there. It calls the area along Two Lights Road and Kettle Cove Roads rural protection areas and Class A scenic view protection areas, part of which means no building, but part of which means keeping the old quiet. And um, so I, I would hope that we would be able to do that. This petition that I'm going to give you tonight is signed by my friends and neighbors on Fessenden, um, Two Lights and Kettle Cove Road, and it says, we the undersigned request that the town council abide by the decision that was made in 1994 to maintain Jordan Farm Road as a limited access way for the following reasons. One, the farm ponds on Jordan Farm Road have been designated as a class two wetland. Two, the town designated Two Lights Road and Kettle Cove area as high priority and scenic views in the 1989 comprehensive plan. That's before I could find my 1993. And third, um, because of their scenic beauty and by their proximity to Kettle Cove, Crescent Beach, the Lobster Shack, the Lighthouse, Two Lights State Park, Maxwell's Strawberry Fields and Season, Two Lights, Fessenden, and Kettle Cove roads are currently heavily traveled by cars, bicycle riders, rollerbladers, runners, and walkers. Additional traffic will further degrade scenic beauty and the quality of neighborhood life will threaten the safety of young children living on or going to school on Jordan Farm, Two Lights, Fessenden, and Kettle Cove Roads. So this is signed by 97 people, adding to the 60-ish that came to before. Thank you. Oh, 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 a few more late-breaking signatures here. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yeah. I would like to say that we'd like to take a little five minute break after the last person that's in line now. Others may speak, we just, I just need to get a soda and a break for a minute. <laughs> so, after Mr. Egan, yes. My name is Gail Brusgo and I live at 24 Broad Cove Road. Excuse me, what was the name again? Gail Brusgo. And I'm sure everyone thinks that they know exactly what I'm going to say because I live on that infamous road and, and the traffic is crazy. But I think basically what we're all trying to say here, perhaps I can say on my side, is that we just want to equalize what's happening in the neighborhood. It sounds like we're going for an all or nothing. Either you know we're going to destroy the wetlands and um, add incredible amount of traffic to that side of the neighborhood, when in essence all we re really want to do is alleviate some of it on our side. And I don't think we have to kill the wetlands to do that. I think plenty of the wetlands will be left so that people can still enjoy it. And I think it's sad to say that I'm here, you know, listening to people save the wetlands when I can't even let my seven-year-old play in his yard. So tomorrow when he waits for the bus and he has to wait 50 feet back because a car, you know, so many cars are back and forth, what am I going to say to him, Zachary? Um, you can't go in the street because there's too much traffic because we're saving the wetlands. I mean, a seven-year-old isn't going to understand that. Um, so I think if we can just at least get the respect the issue deserves and the town council brings it to the planning board and they help us determine what needs to get done, I think that that's the appropriate thing to do. Um, I think it's ironic, though, that what we're saying, the residents of Broad Cove and the other areas that are affected by the traffic pattern, is that what we're saying, we're actually saying the same thing. We're saying all of that traffic is unacceptable to us. And so is the other side. That's why they don't want anybody on that road, because that traffic is unacceptable to them. So you would hope that you know, people would think about this beyond the context of um, intangible or inhumane things like the wetlands and roads and, and all of this, and think about it as just a neighborly kind of thing where we all try to sit down and work together and figure out a way that we can equalize how crazy the traffic is in one part of the neighborhood and how it's, you know, fine in the other. That's it. Good evening. I'm Sylvia Kostopoulos, and I live at 28 Broad Cove Road. And my husband and I have uh, lived at Broad Cove for 30 years. And 
actually, Jane, and this young woman basically said what I was here to, to say also. I think we're all concerned about the same issues, our property values and the wetlands and everything, but we are people and we live on Broad Cove. I've lost three pets there. I don't let my cat out of the house anymore. I've had a car totaled there and another car badly damaged. Backing out of my own driveway, which I do very carefully, um, we cannot allow our grandchildren. It was very quiet when we moved there. There were lots of wetlands and fields that I walked to along Broad Cove when we moved here. It was absolutely beautiful. And it's still beautiful, but there's progress happening. We're having a lot of houses built in this area. And we're all concerned about the same thing. We want the quality of our neighborhood. But we need to consider people. And what many of us are dealing with is that we live on a freeway now. We never did. It was a beautiful, quiet neighborhood when we, when we moved here. And all we want is just what this young woman said. We want to equalize. We want you to consider that we, when we bought our homes, we were all told that there was going to be another access road out of here. And now a gentleman stands up and says that 10 years ago, they decided that that was not, that nothing has changed since then and they weren't going to have an access road. But things have changed, and we do need an access road. And I think that the council must consider all the people on Bro Broad Cove and the number of homes that are affected here, and the fact that Broad Cove is nothing like uh, Two Lights Road, which is a wider road, an open road, a straight road. We live on a very curved road that is extremely dangerous, and it's becoming more so every day. The other day, about a week and a half ago, I was getting my mail. I got, had to leap <laughs> off the, 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 I wasn't even, there's no curb, but I was very close to my mail, but I had to leap off. The person that wa went zooming by saw me fall against my mailbox and took off even faster so I couldn't get the plate. Now I watch people on Broad Cove passing me because if somebody's coming up fast behind me, I deliberately slow down to a crawl, intentionally. And you know what they do now? They go by you on Broad Cove. Something has to happen on that street, and I plead that you will hear her, hopefully. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Hector Terraza, and I live on 34 Broad Cove Road. And I'm going to be very brief, because I know my daughter still has some Spanish homework to do, and I need to go help her. Um, <laughs> First of all, I want to thank the council for the opportunity to hold these public hearings on this very important issue. Um, it's interesting, as I look around the crowd, I see people for and against it, and I work with many people who are against it, and obviously everyone knows how I stand. I'm, I'm actually for this. I just want to share with you a, a day in the life of the Terrazas as, as it typifies today. Um, I have an 11-year-old and a 12-year-old who are at the Cape Middle School, and interestingly enough, um, approximately um, eight years ago, my son almost got killed by a car um, who was speeding uh, along that. And my wife has effortlessly campaigned with the police chief and with, uh, with the authorities about the issue of the traffic. And there's two, two major issues that, that are involved. It's, it's the quality of the traffic and the quantity of the traffic that, that really has become critical. We're, we're at a point today where a, a typical day today um, my son wanted to go bike riding, and I don't allow him to go bike riding um, in, in that particular, in our particular neighborhood. Uh, my son went to CCD tonight at St. Bartholomew's. That's 100 yards away from my house. I will not let him walk back from St. Bartholomew's because it is unsafe. It is clearly unsafe. Now, as, as members of the council here, of town council, you are now privy to very what I feel is very important information. It now becomes our responsibility as citizens to, to rectify this process itself. I would hate to have to go to the f a funeral of any child in that particular neighborhood where the homily has to be based on the fact that this didn't have to happen because we didn't do something about it. The authorities are trying to slow down the, the speed of, in this particular neighborhood, but it's not working. I can tell you it's not working. I sit out there every single day and yell at people to slow down. It is not a safe road. It is clearly not a safe road. I do care about the environment and environmental protection, but the first environment I need to protect is my children's environment. I do care about the property of the, uh, and, and, the, and the quality uh, of our neighborhood itself. 
But more important than that, I care about the citizens who live in our neighborhood, and their safety is paramount. It is the most important element that we have to care in this community. Thank you very much. My name is David Sterling. I live at 52 Broad Cove Road. And you know where I stand. I want a second entrance to Broad Cove. Uh, I, let me first say that the two people that have talked about sharing in the neighborhood as far as the traffic volume is what I'm driving at. In other words, can part of the neighborhood now share some of the volume we have? I think this, the town of Cape Elizabeth, which is a lovely place, should first of all build a sidewalk along Broad Cove Road because it's the most dangerous road I've experienced and I've driven everywhere in the United States. Secondly, if, if Jordan Farm Road is such a poor location for a second entrance, let's find another location. There's got to be another, there's got to be a door. Now I'm going to, now I'm going to speak to you in the first person. I ran an unofficial survey on the cars going by my house, strictly unofficial. And the unofficial part of it is, I have some rose bushes and I mowed the outside of the lawn between the road and the rose bushes. It takes me approximately five minutes to do that. Twenty-five cars went by me. I think that's too many. Now, uh, yeah, wetlands. Yeah, we're going to hurt wetlands. I got wetlands in my backyard. It's called an open storm sewer and it goes into a, a, a catch basin in my backyard. So I know what wetlands are. And secondly, uh, or uh, additionally, I admire your approach with bicycles. But I'm going to tell you, I can't ride a bike to work. I've had a stroke and I can't ride a bike. So I have to go to work every day. So uh, I'll end it by saying that I think we're having part of the people that are against this are under the same syndrome that many others had. I want easy access to the turnpike, but don't build it by my house. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dan Fishbein, 19 Salisbury Lane. Um, just wanted to start by saying I think it's unfortunate but certainly understandable how much emotion is being expressed on both sides of this issue. Broad Cove has always been a very close-knit neighborhood and hopefully after this issue is debated it will continue to be so. Um, when we bought our house we were fully aware of how much traffic there was on the road and that's not really the concern I want to address tonight because that's something we we knowingly bought into. Also do want to recognize I think on both sides of the issue tonight very, very good points have been made, including some that I had not uh, previously considered. And by the way, I was particularly intrigued by the idea of giving uh, everyone on my street uh, oceanfront property. I think we should <laughs> pursue that. Um, I want to share just a brief anecdote, um, and it relates to the, the big flood we had a few years ago. I think it was October of 1997. Um, as you probably recall, around midday, around noon, many roads around Greater Portland uh, started to be cut off. And the intersection of Broad Cove Road and Salisbury Lane was cut off during the mid to latter portion of that afternoon by very severe flooding. Um, during that evening, I discovered that my basement was flooding as were the basements of our two neighbors. Another neighbor very graciously volunteered, uh, unbeknownst to us actually, to get in his car and go into downtown Portland to get a sump pump that he had to help uh, rescue his neighbors. And being that the road was completely cut off, he went out on the emergency access road, Jordan Farm Road, to find that the chain was in place. And this was at 9 o'clock at night. So it was quite a few hours after the road had been completely cut off. So while it's quite possible that there's been a good record of opening the chain when an emergency vehicle arrives, it's not true that there's been a good record of opening that road promptly when the neighborhood has been cut off. And in fact, we, the single access road that we do have today, not only is it a single access road, it's not reliable. It get, gets cut off several times a year, and it's not routinely replaced 
uh, with an alternative access. Um, the fact is we have 237 homes, and those 237 homes have probably done far more damage to the natural environment than a few additional feet of pavement could ever possibly do. And to suggest that completing um, a natural safety feature that goes along with having 237 homes could somehow be the straw that breaks the camel's back of the natural environment just doesn't make a great deal of sense to me. Thank you. My name is Bob Bogosian. I live at 13 Salisbury Lane, and uh, I've been there for about 20 years. And it's really been an experience watching this uh, evolution uh, in, in terms of this road and the road opening and what's gone on over the years. As a matter of fact, I was talking to my daughter, who's uh, 25 years old, who lived through one of these episodes, and she reminded me that when she was in the sixth grade, I believe it was, she was 11 years old, she did a class report on this road and came to town hall and got maxed and, and wrote a report and even got an A on it. So this thing's been around for a long, long time. We've heard a lot tonight from both sides, but the thing that seems to punctuate the people that are opposed to opening Blood Cove Road is the environment. And I think it's a fair issue. I don't think anybody that is uh, um, in favor of opening the road really uh, would like to do anything to hurt the environment. I mean, we, we live in a coexistence, if you will. But the thing that troubles me so much, is with all the talk about the pristine area in that uh, particular wetlands area, Nobody's really told us what would happen if we put cars through there. You know, everybody said the wetlands would be ruined, the pond would be ruined, the fauna would be ruined, there'd be no animals, there'd be death and destruction. I don't think that's the case. The, 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 the talk of runoff and what it would do to the pond, for example, is absolutely ludicrous. It doesn't make any difference whether water goes down through the, road, the gravel road surface and then spreads out, which is what it will do as it hits the water table, or comes off the side of the road, hits the water table, and, got, and does what it's supposed to do. The, the, the water doesn't change. There's some people there that think that it's going to flood if we put a road in. That's absolutely ludicrous. How could it flood? What would change? Nothing would change. As a matter of fact, Steve Pelletier put it very, very clearly tonight when he said, hey, this is the wetlands. The wetland rules have changed, and we certainly could put a road in there if we do it the right way. As a matter of fact, he said we would enhance the quality of the wetlands. And I'm all for that. I think it's great. It's a very, the pictures were gorgeous. You know, they should be framed uh, and put up on the wall somewhere. They're really pretty. But that, those pictures won't change if that road is paved. What would happen? The trees would die? I don't think so. We don't have MTBE in our gasoline anymore, so we won't have to worry about that. So that road will basically not change the environment there at all. And the fact that this area looks nothing like it did when the DE, DEP permitted it way back when, nine years ago. It doesn't look anything like that anymore. There's culverts under the road, plastic, all right? The bane of environmentalists under the road, carrying water. The, uh, even at the wettest season, there isn't that much water that ever make a difference. There are no nesting birds in there. There's no growth in that pond. That pond is a man-made pond. My God, you know, somebody dug a hole there because they needed to have some water to irrigate something years ago. It's still there. There's nothing really of importance in that pond. The French gentian that everybody's talking about is no longer endangered. So that becomes a moot point. So I think that the environmental issues, while we should seek to do everything we can to preserve them, are really minimalized. And, you know, Dr. Blumenthal here mentioned riding a bicycle. I think it's a great idea. I don't know that I could do it every day because I'm not as physically fit as so many people in our neighborhood might be. But if you choose to ride a bicycle, that's great. I don't choose to do that. So when the town originally set up the map and permitted those streets in there, they really permitted two accesses and entrances. And under current um, ordinances, you cannot have a road more than a thousand feet, I believe that's correct, without two entrances and exits. You would no more allow, anybody in this town would no, lo no longer, uh, no more allow a building to be built that had only one door. So people inside couldn't get out if there was a fire. Why would you do that with a road? Why would you trap so many people in an environment where they can't get out if something happens? 
Now, we have, a gated, we have a gate down there. This is not a gated community. This is not a gated community. Lots of things could happen to that gate. I don't think they have yet, but let's take a couple of scenarios. Suppose we get some kids that put super glue in the cylinders, and I'm not, I hope nobody's watching this, so uh, I'm going to take that to heart. It's only somebody puts super glue in the cylinders, or puts sticks up the cylinders, or does something to incapacitate the locks. What are we going to do if we need to get in there? What happens if we can't put those chains down and somebody is having a carnery? What happens if we do pave that road and we can get a piece of emergency apparatus and say an ambulance to somebody who's having a heart attack on that side of the neighborhood? That minute, there's a one minute difference that, that makes uh, a, a lot of sense, okay? Somebody's life is going to be saved. So this idea that that access road works is not necessarily true because it's never really been tested. We've had a lot of things happen in our neighborhood. Um, in terms of emergencies, we had somebody die in a house fire on Hunts Point Road. <coughs> Anybody remember that? Yeah. I think that person might have lived if the road wasn't cut off. It's, 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 it's a matter of safety. It's not an environmental issue. The environment's not going to change very much. It's a matter of safety. People are comparing Two Lights Road with Broad Cove. Apples and oranges. Two Lights Road is much wider. It's got a higher speed limit. It's 35. Broad Cove is 25. It's a major thoroughfare. And only 16 houses are impacted if people turn right and don't go down to the lighthouse. If they go down the lighthouse, they would have gone around and gone to the lighthouse anyhow. So that's really a moot point. So, we, we don't want to trash the environment. A lot's changed in the last nine years. And we want the safety of the citizens of Broad Cove to be paramount in everybody's mind. There was a couple mentions tonight about the sudden outcry from people after all these years. I don't think it's a sudden outcry. I think people are mumbling and grumbling. It just took a few of us to get together to try and bring the issue to a head. This has been going on for years and years and years. I think uh, back in 1968, the planning board actually authorized the opening of Jordan Farm Road. But what happened was there was some kind of a bureaucratic staff bill and it never got into the minutes and therefore never got passed and the road was never open. The town has always wanted that road open. They have always wanted the road open and nobody can convince me any differently. There was this, an assertion that we didn't canvass the entire neighborhood. That's absolutely not true. We went out and did our best effort to get to everybody. Now, we did this in August because the meeting was coming up in September. And we may not have gotten everybody. I readily admit to that. Some people weren't home. There are people in our neighborhood who won't answer the door if somebody rings the doorbell, believe it or not. Um, and, and a lot of people were gone, kids at camp and whatnot. So we did the best job we could. We think we got a representative of people around the neighborhood who really feel this road should be open. We also are pretty sure that the town is going to have to go, by the way, to the DEP and permit the opening and get a permit to open that road up when they do Broad Cove Road. Am I wrong at that? We're not answering questions. <laughs> oh, excuse me. I'll make a statement then. I believe <laughs> that the town is going to have to go to the DEP anyhow and ask, them, ask for a permit to open that road so that traffic can pass while they're working on Broad Cove Road. As I understand it, they're putting sewer lines in above the church there. I mean, we know, those of us who live through the uh, sewering of Broad Cove know the mess that happens. Uh, it, it's really going to be a mess. And uh, so that's going to have to be opened up, or something's going to have to be opened up. That's the only thing that makes sense. Nothing else has got a roadbed to it. Could you move towards summary, Bob? You're at nine minutes. Um, it was, really? I got my little watch out. Okay. The point I want to make is this. There's been a lot of passion on both sides, and I can empathize with everybody. But I want to tell you this. That road should be open. It should have been open years ago. We are not in conformance technically with the town ordinance, although they're considering that uh, uh, emergency access road as a secondary road. And again, you would no more put uh, one door in a building for a room full of people. So if there was a fire, they, would ha they wouldn't have a second exit to get out. Thank you very much.
Thank you. My name is Mary Ellen Pelter. I live at 37 Broad Cove Road. My house is probably the closest house to the street on Broad Cove Road. Okay? I have two small boys and an older daughter who I trust. Many of you have seen me outside watching my kids and watching my boys. I'm the one who stands at the end of the driveway when they ride bikes. When they're seriously riding, I put the car across the driveway and still stand there. Whether you open the road or don't open the road, my boys will continue to be watched, okay? I don't have a lot of facts and figures. I just have a lot of passion. I can't walk the streets in Broad Cove or on Broad Cove with my boys. They're four and five years old. I hold their hands. We walk three abreast. I'm either walking on somebody's lawn or I'm walking down the street with one in front of me and one in back of me because the cars, they will go around you if there's only a single car, but if there's double cars, it's too close to call. And my kids' safety, as many of you have said, is the main issue. I've heard many of you say that if you opened up a building, you had to have fire exits. Yeah, that's true. So you all call in Jordan Farm Road with its little rope across it. Uh, safety, it's safety. It's, clo it's got the little thing across, it's an emergency access. Well, you know what? If you put a rope or a chain or a box or anything in any public building in front of a fire exit, the fire marshal comes in and gives you a fine. And I speak from that from experience of 20 years' experience in retail. All fire exits have to be cleared and accessible. That's in buildings as well as it should be on roads. Please, I ask of you, do not wait for a fatality. There has been so many near misses. Near misses are not reported to the police, okay? Don't wait for a child to be hit by a car. Don't wait for an adult to be hit by a car. Don't wait for someone in their car to be hit by another car. Or how about some of those big old dump trucks that are driving down the street at 40 miles an hour, and they're filled with dirt. And I'm not from Maine. And I've seen those kind of accidents where people have ran lights, ran stop signs, and I've seen the kind of damage that a truck can do to a car, to a child. And I've had friends who have been killed by being hit by cars, by having trucks run lights. Don't wait for a fatality. Whether it's the safety of my family or anyone else's family, we all enjoy Boyd Cove. And to those of you who are so worried about your wetlands, guess what? I have wetlands in my backyard. And you know what? I have wildlife too. I have seen deer. I have seen foxes. I have heard coyotes. I have seen birds that I've never seen before. And I've even seen a moose on 77. The wildlife in Cape Elizabeth is not only on Jordan Farm Road. <laughs> Wetlands. We don't want to pave wetlands. Wetlands are beautiful. We want to pave the existing road. So whether you pave it or don't pave it, open it. Let the people choose whether or not to use it. It's not a private road. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Tom Egan. I live uh, with my wife Hillary and three kids at Hannaford Cove Road, 41 Hannaford Cove Road. I've owned that property there since 1980 and have enjoyed living in this part of town immensely. Uh, over that time, I've seen the changes that have been spoken about here. And I'd like to address tonight some of the safety issues that I've seen um, arise on Two Lights Road in spe uh, specifically. I'm going to address the safety issues because I think there are, if I can summarize this, there appears to be five issues before you tonight. One is safety, and I think that is the first and foremost issue for the town council to consider when it addresses this, this uh, proposal. The second issue is the environment. The third issue appears to be quality of life. And the fourth is issue, as I see it, is equity. So I'll address most of my remarks to safety, and it will be from my perspective as a 20-year resident of Hannaford Cove Road. Uh, over the years, 
the amount of traffic has increased on, on, on Two Lights Road. And I think the statistics that are before you on the report of a traffic engineer that I, I heard about the other day will, will show that. The traffic has also increased on Broad Cove Road. They've increased relatively the same. The question is, what about accidents? What about speeding? What has happened in these two respective areas that could help you uh, analyze the impacts of, of the decision that you're about to make. If the traffic reports are true, it appears there are more accidents on Two Lights Road than there have been on uh, uh, Broad Cove Road. There have been, there's been a death uh, to a bicycle rider on Two Lights Road. There was a serious injury to a bicycle rider on Two, light, two Lights Road. And I think this was within, I believe this is within the last 10 years. <clears throat> I'm not, I don't know whether there's been any bicycle or pedestrian accidents on Broad Cove Road. In the years since I've been living on Hannaford Cove Road, the, no, the amount of traffic has increased on Two Lights Road in particular because of an increase in the volume of people coming to the park and people coming to the lobster shack. The lobster shack season has expanded from, I think it was about mid-May to September 15, now to uh, the end of March or mid-March to uh, the la last week of October. And so that has increased in the amount of traffic in what's known as our, our tourist season out at that end of uh, the Cape. So as those of us who are riding bikes on two lights, those of us who are uh, walking, those of us who might even occasionally take their life in their hands and rollerblade on that road, which I have done, find that there, the traffic is, is uh, going faster. Even though the speed limit is down from 40 to 35, it still is very, very fast. And uh, in anecdote, I can tell you that when turning out from Hannaford Cove Road onto Two Lights Road, the cars coming over the hill from Massachusetts, from Illinois, from Rhode Island, are going like 60, and you take your life in your hands at that intersection. And the same is true, by the way, at the, what's known as the Chai Cane, I call it the Chai Cane, which is at the end of Two Lights Road where it meets Route 77. There's this neat S curve that people seem to take at greater and greater speeds as they come off uh, Route 77. And there are, are blind driveways there, the driveway into uh, uh, St. Bart's, for example. So that intersection is particularly bad as it is, and it will get worse if there's more traffic on it. For example, it's an acute angle. Uh, when you meet, when Two Lights Road meets Route 77, instead of a 90 degree angle at the intersection, you have an acute angle. And any traffic engineer will tell you that those are more dangerous intersections than 90 degree angle intersections. If the traffic is to be increased on Two Lights Road because it is to be decreased on Broad Cove Road, then the proposition that the proponents are making that increased traffic increases the likelihood of accidents will cause an increase in the likelihood of accidents on Two Lights Road. It's that simple. As far as quality of life goes, I'm not going to address the environment, but as far as quality of life goes, Two Lights Road is a wonderful road that it's a, it's a country road, it's, it's open, it's fast, it seems to be a little dangerous, but, but if you load it up with more traffic, our quality of life will be degraded as their quality of life will be enhanced. And it's a, that's a, how you weight that, I don't know. So it seems to me you've got to come right back to the safety issue. Setting aside for the moment the traffic safety issue, 
and looking at ingress and egress, I would ask whether it has been determined by the police, uh, by the captain, by uh, fire officials, by an emergency ambulance service drivers, whether that road works for safety, for ingress and egress for them under extreme circumstances, whether it's weather, whether it's the danger to the individual that they're trying to save or the fire they're trying to put out, does that ingress and egress work as it presently stands with the lock on it? If it doesn't work, maybe the lock should be removed. And that would resolve the safety issue. I, 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 I don't know why there's a lock there. Is there a lock there to prevent people from using it as an ingress and egress and causing uh, problems for, uh, for the neighbors? I don't know, but it would seem to me that the police could do something about preventing people from using that, uh, that ingress and egress uh, for other than safety reasons. And lastly, with respect to speed on Broad Cove Road, as someone who has been stopped multiple times, <laughs> uh, I can tell you that uh, the, the salutary impact of the Sheriff's uh, Service or the Scarborough Police out on uh, uh, Prout's Neck is tremendous. I ride my bike out there about two or three times a week, and I can tell you they have people pulled over all the time. And what is the, the impact? 25 miles an hour. They're going 25 down there. So maybe, maybe the answer to speeding is enforcement. That's all I have to say. Thank you. My name is Desmina Athens, and I live at 6 Hunts Point Road in Cape Elizabeth. I've been a resident of Cape Elizabeth for only four years, and I hadn't planned to say much tonight, although I felt a lot of the things that I'm supporting the people of Broad Cove, and I think I ought to tell you why. Um, number one, I was the house that was on fire. I was very happy that due to the efficiency and the wonderful uh, quick response of the fire department, the damage was very minimal. And considering that I had spent a lot of money and a lot of time in aggravation getting a lot of things done to my new house, it was a great big thing for me under any circumstances. The second thing is that I also was there when the flood came and I was pinned in and couldn't get out. And when I got there, I didn't know that there was a flood and there was all this water coming down. I had to turn around and go through Jordan Farm Road. Mm -hmm. And I, that's the first time that I knew that there was no second access out of C Cape Elizabeth. I did not know that there was another, the only one exit, Rod Cove. And people said to me, you didn't know? Nobody told you? And I said, no, I didn't know. I don't know that it would have made any difference, but at the same time, I did not know that there was not another access, but I was amazed that there wasn't. I couldn't believe it. And the third thing is, in the four years that I've been there, I have seen myself, the traffic on Broad Cove, so, and I mean grow, to the point where I really think that road is so dangerous that I really have to say something. I, it wasn't only just a few weeks ago, and I've seen it many times. I, there was a boy on a bicycle ahead of me going up uh, Broad Cove, and that he's looking back all the time because obviously I was behind him and I slowed down to a crawl because I wasn't going to let him get hurt. And he couldn't see in front of him because there were cars in front of him. And I almost died until we got to the top and he was safe. But my daughter is a grown woman, and she has a bicycle and loves to bicycle. And every she, time she comes to Cape Elizabeth, she does not bicycle away from my house. Her friends come in cars with their bicycles on them, and they take off for some place. They don't like Broad Cove bicycling. So I just thought I'd put that in. And I also have to say that I've lived in a number of places, and there hasn't been a community that I've lived in that hasn't faced the same problem with the wishes of those who prefer to uh, to preserve the environment and all that, all of which we respect, everybody does. We, none of us want to ruin the environment. But the wishes of the few should not prevail on the safety and the necessities of the many. And I've seen this time and time again, and they usually overcome. I just thought I'd like to add this.
we were going to take a break two people ago, so okay. we're going to take a break after you, and then we're happy to listen again. Okay, I, I'm not going to be real popular what I say because um, I'm going to talk, I, it sounds like most of these people live on Broad Cove, and I do feel, feel very much, it it's seems like a very dangerous street. I live at, my name is Jill Morris, I live at 24 Hunts Point, the house where the fellow died, um, which I didn't know until after I bought the house either. I don't think that was very fair <laughs> for them not to tell me. Um, I am not a long-term residence here in Cape, um, but I do want to say that I've lived in Arizona, uh, rural areas of Arizona. I've lived in rural areas of, uh, of uh, California and uh, Massachusetts as well. And I go back after 10 years, and I see the growth and the destruction and, and the subways on streets that were beautiful before. And I have been so impressed by Cape and its, and its opening of lands and its keeping of the, the beauty of it, and not selling out, not, um, I, I have, you know, hope no one's here, but I was sort of upset with Cove View when that came in. I was really shocked that they would allow that those huge homes and the equipment that went by my house often, I, I was amazed. But I do have to say, um, I have a dog, and I do walk my dog over at the Robinson property, at the marsh across from the dump, um, I take him to the beaches, but that one road, and I hate to say it, and everyone's going to get mad at me, is absolutely the most beautiful road I've, I've seen in Cape Elizabeth. I have seen animals. I'd love to go to someone's house. If, if people want to invite me, if it gets paved, I'll come to your houses and hang out in your backyard to look at the, <laughs> the deer and the moose. But that is where I see them. I see birds I've never seen before. It is absolutely gorgeous. I do agree that we do need another access road there. I really do. But if some alternative, and I, I just have gotten involved in this, mainly because of what I've seen in the five or six places where I've lived that possibly have not been as rural as Cape Elizabeth, and certainly have not been as aware of the environment and the, and the, the beauty. Um, and I, I went back to western Massachusetts, uh, where I lived for four years, and I didn't even recognize the town where I lived. Um, it, it, was shy, it shocked me. And I think that's the only thing that really frightens me, um, is taking away, um, yes, it is beautiful. And, and it, people say, well, you know, we have to think of the people. Well, I, lived in, I grew up in Los Angeles, and they really thought of the people a lot. <laughs> and if you go to Los Angeles now, uh, the people have taken over a lot of, uh, of beautiful areas, and it's, it's very scary. I agree that something needs to be done, but I just wish that that road in particular could just be saved. I, um, again, just from my experience in living in other places and my delight and love of Cape Elizabeth and its keeping some of these areas that are so beautiful, accessible, readily accessible to the public. So that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to take about a five minute break and um, we're certainly happy to continue to hear people who wish to speak. Um, so we'll, we'll be back here at um, just before quarter after. How much of the soda does that say? Do I bring a dollar? Loud. We can we can we can suspend the rules, right? Well, they might very well be. I mean, we're I think we're minutes away from getting to that. Because I don't think there's too many. I don't think there's maybe. Thank you and welcome back and thank you very much for the break. I needed that. And we're ready to proceed. I see people lined up here and ready. Hello, my name is Pam Mullen. And I live at 44 Two Lights Road. And I just have to stand up here because of the safety issue that um, Broad Cove has brought up. Um, the people that live on the Two Lights side and the people who live on Broad Cove side both have passion on their children. And I feel strongly that I need to be here to give the passion on the two light side because it is a very dangerous road as Broad Cove Road is too with the amount of traffic. Um, 
my children can't have a lemonade stand unless they have two big orange cones sitting out on Two Lights Road. And I put a, I place a board up there for my children and as well as the children that come to the school because the, the cars speed by. I happen to be on that very straight stretch where I can hear the cars revving as they come around the Wheeler Road and I can hear the cars revving as they come around to uh, Red and Louise's house. And um, I just think channeling the traffic from one area to another area is not going to answer anybody's problems as far as the safety of the children in either Broad Cove or Two Lights Road. Um, I asked my daughter to get the mail and I looked out 20 minutes later because I had forgotten as I was cooking supper or lunch or whatever it was, why isn't she back? She was still standing in the driveway waiting to cross the road to get the mail because we have so much traffic. And I, it, it, it needs to be addressed on Broad Cove, but it also needs to be addressed on our side too. I just don't feel the tr channeling from Broad Cove onto our side, or the, our side is going to be any help. So I need to add that. Plus the fact that Two Lights Road isn't truly fully developed all the way down to Hanover Cove Road and the other way to Pheasanton Road. I think as time goes on, it's going to be even worse. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, my name's Holly Ovenden. I live at 10 Jordan Farm Road. What was your last name? Ovenden. And I felt like I had to speak as I've been sitting listening to both sides. And from where I live right now, I've got the most to gain by convenience if it opens and the most to lose if it, you know, if it does open. But um, the thing I wanted to say is because I also have four small children. My neighbors have three. My other neighbors have five. And the thing that has caught me the most has been listening to all the people passionately worried about their children. And that's something I, I really understand because I feel the same way. And I don't know what the solution is to this, but I've been sitting here thinking with the speed, how does opening a road stop people from speeding? I mean, I see people coming out of their driveways, you know, three, three houses down from where they live, and they're already speeding. So it's not as if it's like, well, I have a long way to go. I have to hurry to get out of here. I live the farthest, the absolute farthest in the neighborhood to get out. And I don't have to speed 40 miles an hour down the road to get out. I've chosen to live in that spot that takes me a long time out because of the environment, because we were told it was a dead end road. And I kind of lost track of figures here as there's been so many tonight, but if I was correct in hearing, I think the opposition had said that about 600 cars would be diverted. If I was anywhere near correct, I would still leave 1,500 cars going out Broad Cove Road. And I, I guess the point I wanted to make is how do you measure whose house they're going to speed by? And is that really an issue with the speeding is by opening another through road to put, I don't want their children to be jeopardized, but I also don't want my children to be jeopardized. Thank you. Thank you. My name is David Glacier and I live at 20 Salt Spray Lane. Uh, I'd like to bring up three points. One is, uh, going to the history in general. When I purchased my house in 1981, I specifically talked to people in the town government and I talked to a member of the town council and we discussed that there would be a, at some point in time as the neighborhood developed, a second access road to uh, Broad Cove. The problems of speeding are balanced on both sides. The problems of uh, volume of traffic, of diverting one to the other, somebody's getting those houses, in, and I grasp that as a difficult balancing uh, problem. But what can't be overcome without putting in a second road is how do you have a second access for safety? That is, can only be solved by opening a second road. There is no other alternative to that. Uh, reducing the speed, enforcing traffic rules, uh, nothing solves that one question of having a second access road. Uh, secondly, to give you a specific example, which I didn't call the police and I didn't report, um, but what, the one that uh, Dan, uh, Dan talked about was uh, when, the, when there was an emergency in Broad Cove, when Salt Spray Lane was cut off, the chain was not lowered uh, so that there was a second access to it. Uh, people could not get in and out uh, from the corner of, of Salt Spray and Broad Cove uh, back out to Route 77 for several hours. So the chain specifically, the emergency road specifically did not work. Another example 
of having a single access is that uh, prior prior to the road, uh, Jordan Pond Road, even even uh, being partially developed, was when the sewer was being built. Um, my daughter uh, had an emergency. Um, my wife had to rush her to the hospital. She was driving down Salisbury Lane onto Broad Cove Road, and lo and behold, the road is blocked for sewer construction. The gentlemen were very accommodating. They put uh, a steel plate over the hole, but there were several minutes of delay, which could have been alleviated by going the other way. Fortunately, my daughter made it to the emergency room on time. The catastrophe was averted, but if, if it were something that couldn't be solved that quickly, a catastrophe could have occurred. Um, the, the third is, in just entering something into the minutes, uh, I'd like to read from the November 21st, 1989 Planning Board notes, uh, where Mr. Mr. McGovern said, we should look at the Broad Cove history. Back in 1968-69, when Running Tide Road was approved, when part of Hunts Point Road extension was approved, as well as Mansfield Terrace, or Maysfield Terrace, it was the planning board's intent at that time to require a full road out to Two Lights Road where Farm Pond Road is. Apparently they made an error when they actually passed the motion and failed to put that in the conditions. Two pages of excerpts from the minutes that made it very clear that it was the desire and the intent of the planning board and it was simply an error when, it, when they passed it. And it was something they tremendously regretted right away. My feeling is that it should be the town council's position to move this on to the planning board and then on to, the, and if the planning board approves, then on to DEP. We have a question of what the impact will be we have an agency in the state government which can decide that. If they decide that the impact is too great, they will say, no, you can't put the road through. If a, a, an appropriate plan can be presented to DEP that doesn't have a substantial environmental impact, they will agree with it. So that we should, you know, it should be the position of this uh, council to move it on to the next step or I, I wish that the, the council would do that, move it on to, allow it to move on to the next step and let it be decided through the three levels, uh, the three procedures that there are set up. Thank you. Good evening. My name's Tricia Nadeff. I live at 11 Fessenden Road. The little road that now Steve Blumenthal has to hang on to his kids as he's walking down. Um, I want to speak, I guess, and uh, I didn't plan to speak tonight, but listening to everybody, it's getting late. I guess you get a little bleary-eyed and sort of get compelled to talk. Um, I'll keep it short. Um, it seems to me that what we're speaking about is pretty universal, whether you look on this side of the nice colored map or our side, which is only done in black and white, um, I'm sure was not meant to indicate we were less important. Um, but there. There are two big neighborhoods here that are facing the same kinds of issues, and they are um, the issues of safety, um, the issues of equity, um, the issue of environment that I haven't heard anybody say isn't important, but where does it fit in the priorities. I have a concern that what we are doing is only looking at one position, one potential solution. Open up the road or don't open up the road. Um, and whether we open up the road or don't open up the road, um, we are going to be left with the same percentage of safety issues. It will just be shif shifted from one side to the other. So fundamentally, in this whole area of Cape Elizabeth, we don't get rid of any of the safety issue. We just move it from one end to the other. And so maybe a year from now, we'll be sitting here and you'll be listening to all of us on the black and white side <laughs> wanting to do something. Um, I guess what I would like to offer, um, because certainly I am not unbiased in this, I would have a preference to keep the black and white part of the graph um, as close to as it is now as possible, so I don't pretend to be objective. But what I would like to offer is perhaps a suggestion that um, Mr. Roberts invited all of us to engage in committees and task force at the early part of the evening, for those of you who remember. I wonder if in some part of your discussion, you might imagine um, 
is there something that we could do besides just to bake this one solution? Is there a way for the people in both neighborhoods, the Broad Cove neighborhood and the Two Lights neighborhood, to come together and address the issues of safety, um, both access and safety in terms of speed? I'm sure the people in Broad Cove um, would like to protect the children in the Two Lights neighborhood just as much as their own. Um, there may be a few adults that they're not as concerned about, but probably the children. Um, I'm sure that we all have the same level of attention to the environment within some span of the continuum. So I guess what I would like to suggest, if it hasn't already crossed your mind, is perhaps there may be a way to envision thinking of solutions beyond just this road opening or closing as the only way of addressing these issues for two neighborhoods. Could you, could you tell us your last name? I didn't quite get it. Big number two. <laughs> Nadaf, N-A-D-D-A-F-F. Hi, Frank. Thanks. You're right. It's a tricky one. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Sarah Tierney, and I live at 71 Hunts Point Road, which is the end of Hunts Point, the dead end, end of Hunts Point Road. And um, I'm not going to add anything new. I guess what I want to say is, um, a couple of things. Um, I have a son. I've had an ambulance come to our house, um, life-threatening emergency, um, risk of another one. I've had fire department come to our house. I've had a fire. I had Mike McGovern out at our house. Um, you probably remember when Cove U went in and they dammed up the culvert and flooded my backyard and messed up my sump pump for the rest of the spring. Um, <coughs> I agree that Broad Cove Road is an extremely dangerous road. Um, there's no getting around it. I don't know um, where the speeders live. I know down in our end of the neighborhood, people drive very fast. We may not have the volume that you have, but we have speeders. I had a babysitter last year who wouldn't take my kids bicycle riding on our dead end. Um, I guess I'm here to talk to the neighbors and say, speed and volume, and we can control those things. We can control speed. Volume, we can control. Um, car cooling, um, Jim had some excellent points, not just about bicycle riding, that was an excellent one, but there were lots of other ones as well. When I drop my son off at preschool, if I've got two hours to spare, I don't zip home. I go out, I bring my bills to the library, I do other things, and I think as a community, we can solve the problem. Um, and that's really all I have to say. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> My name is Chris Tainter. I live at 6 Jordan Farm Road. And I've already uh, thrown away all the notes I had of what I intended to say tonight because pretty much all of it's been said. Um, what I'd like to do is follow up on just a few points that some other people have made and to address those couple of things that are unique to myself and my family. We live at the chain and on the two lights road end of the dirt road on Jordan Farm Road. And my wife Colleen and I moved there just about eight years ago. And we moved there from another neighborhood in Cape Elizabeth that we like very much over on Elmwood Road. And we lived there on a dead end. And when we decided that we needed to move, even though we loved our neighborhood, because we needed more space, we had to face a difficult decision about where our priorities would lie. And we looked at a lot of houses in Broad Cove. And the reason we were interested in Broad Cove was because of the neighborhood feeling, the fact that there were lots of kids for our one existing child and additional planned children to play with. Uh, and that would have been a great thing in a lot of ways. But we also knew that we wanted the seclusion and the safety of the dead end that we'd enjoyed at Elmwood Road. And we felt incredibly fortunate to find the land that we built on, on Jordan Farm Road. I really have the utmost respect for and consideration of all the safety concerns that have been expressed by the folks in Broad Cove. What I take issue with is the suggestion that's implicit in what's been said, that the way to alleviate their safety concerns 
is to endanger my children and to create a traffic problem or to, to aggravate a traffic problem that already exists on Two Lights Road. I'm only 100 yards from Two Lights Road, and anybody who's lived in this town for any period of time knows that Two Lights Road and Fessenden Road are every bit as dangerous as Broad Cove Road. In fact, I would suggest that they're probably more dangerous because so much of the traffic is tourist traffic. You don't get folks who live here who are just going to and from their home and who know where the kids live. Uh, obviously, some of those folks are not as careful as they should be, but I'll tell you that the tourists who fly down Two Lights Road every day of the summer in droves and masses are not the least bit considerate of my children or anyone else's children who try to travel on that road. And I wouldn't allow a child to bicycle by himself or herself on that road under any circumstances. <coughs> I think there's also a mistaken impression that I think shouldn't exist, because I think Red Sullivan's statement at the very beginning of the night should have put it to rest, that there's been some kind of a growth in traffic over the course of the last 10 years, a substantial growth that is out of the norm or that has created some new and unexpected circumstance. And it clearly isn't the case. Traffic in Broad Cove has increased gradually. Traffic on Two Lights Road has increased gradually. And the traffic on Two Lights Road still exceeds that on Broad Cove Road. As someone in this long night pointed out, the only effect of doing what the petitioners are asking you to do or asking you to initiate would be to create a huge disparity, to substantially reduce the traffic on the Broad Cove end of things and to substantially increase it and make it really disproportionate on the two lights end. For all those reasons, I think that the whole fairness argument really doesn't cut it and shouldn't cut it <coughs> with the council. What this is really about is finding a way to protect everybody's children and to keep everybody's quality of life at a reasonable level. And to help one group of people by hurting another and by trying to enhance the quality of some people's lives by harming other people's quality of life is not what I think the business of this council should be about. We should be looking for solutions that help everybody. And if that involves more police efforts to enforce the traffic laws, finding other ways to slow down traffic in Broad Cove, so be it. I'd be all for that happening on Two Lights Road as well. I think it's an important effort. And lastly, I guess I just want to, to say again how uncomfortable I think everyone feels, and I know I feel, by what's been going on tonight, which feels like this incredible tension pitting neighborhood against neighborhood. I think that the, the process that you're being asked to embark on will really only aggravate that because one of the things I think that is clear is that if you ask the Department of Environmental Protection to pave Two Lights Road, excuse me, to pave Jordan Farm Road, one of the things that DEP is going to have to do is ascertain whether there are other ways of accomplishing the same objective, the safety objective, without harming those wetlands. And that will involve analyzing and looking into other potential access points and other potential ways to alleviate the problem in Broad Cove. And I think you're just going down an incredibly dangerous, slippery slope and uh, creating the possibility that there are going to be other neighborhoods involved in this effort. And there are plenty of neighborhoods in Cape Elizabeth that have exactly the same problem <coughs> that Broad Cove has. And I think that the council would be doing a disservice not only to the people in this room here tonight, but to people throughout the town if it starts down that road. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Ann Terraza. <clears throat> I live at 34 Broad Cove Road. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've been watching this on television with my children <laughs> and needed to come down and put my two cents in. Um, my husband spoke a little bit earlier about my son who uh, literally was almost killed 
on his bicycle as well as chasing a ball in front of our home. Um, and my son asked me to promise that I wouldn't say that about that, but that was um, a very scary incident. But that prompted my neighbor and I a couple years ago, Gail Bresco, who spoke earlier, who lives at 24 Broad Cove Road, to begin a petition <clears throat> to address perhaps putting speed bumps in in our segment of the road. That um, fell short. We, we had quite a petition going, and that fell short when we came up against that that would be impossible to do because we only have one access. Now, I don't know how true that is. We got varying um, information regarding that, but we never got any further than that. Um, we, some of the neighbors uh, were planning on moving because um, they were so frustrated with the issue. That was um, perhaps our first choice in addressing the matter with speed bumps. We thought that that perhaps would address both volume as well as speed. Um, if, if this doesn't go to the DEP, then that is an option that I would like to suggest that can be looked at is whether or not we can have speed bumps or whether or not that was true. The second issue is I just want to address as to why it is that um, the volume of traffic affects the speed at our end of the road. Um, I know most of the people who speed. I um, am very keen on who's driving in and out of the road. Um, most of the time, the teenagers get the brunt of the blame, and most of the time, it's not the teenagers. Um, a lot of the time, it's the moms in the, in the minivans. Um, it's um, the, the, the parents in and out trying to get in and out of work, to work quickly. I'm a runner. I run down in that area of the neighborhood. It's well over a mile from my house at the beginning of Broad Cove Road down into the neighborhood. So my point is, is that when you're driving and you're en route to work in the morning, or in the afternoon or in the evening, by the time you get around the corner of the bend coming out of Broad Cove onto the straightaway that leads out to Route 77, your speed increases. Now, I've done my own little study on this and um, followed people. Your speed increases because you've been driving well over a mile to get out. So by the time you turn the corner, 25 does not cut it. Uh, we also tried to see about reducing the speed limit because quite often the the violations and the citations don't reflect the number of speeders that are going by our properties. So um, when you see a patrol car down the end of the road, after the first three or four people that drive by, there's flashers that are t alerting other people that that, that, that uh, patrol person is down there ticketing people. So it's not reflective. Um, we try to get, you know, to, to, to do a study to see the number of people that are cited, and that's not reflective of what's really actually happening. So, you know, my point is, is that because of the number of cars flying out of the neighborhood, by the time you get to my home, your speed is increasing because you're frustrated because you need to get out of the neighborhood. I agree. I think bicycle riding and, and um, any other form is um, a wonderful way as a community to kind of to try and address the problem, but I don't see that as a reality. We live in an area that is somewhat transient. There's a lot of professional people that live in the neighborhood. Um, I admire those who are willing to take the, that next step and, you know, ride a bicycle to work. But I don't see that as a, as a community, as people really doing that in a way that it would affect change in the neighborhood. So um, I've lived here for 13 years. There has definitely been a change and an increase in the number of cars going through. I have suffered. I am pretty much a calm person. And, um, and you know, at one point when uh, somebody passed me, as I had the blinker on to turn left into my home with my two kids in the car. And I find myself literally chasing somebody up Ledgewood who zipped, I could not keep up with this person. And this was not a teenager, this was an adult who zipped into his garage. I called the police when I got home and the police said, you know, Marianne, you can't do that. Um, my kids were in the back seat saying, please mom, don't. But I was so, I had had it, you know, to be passed on Broad Cove Road. I understand that I don't know what the option is or what, what, what should come of this, but Broad Cove Road is very narrow. It should almost be a one-way. You can't fit two cars flying in and out. You can't fit a car passing another car <coughs> as you're driving in. Um, my neighbor, you know, we saw the bus driver get passed by somebody just a, couple, just a week or two ago. Um, that, that's unsafe. So I know that we are all concerned about the safety of all of our children, and whether or not it's the access road or whether or not it's the speed, bump, speed bumps, um, when, 
when we are faced with the fatality of a child or an adult or even a pet, then there's an issue that needs to be addressed. And it's unconscionable that it's gone on this long. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Pete Black. I live on 46 Hunts Point Road. So I'm not directly affected by this petition. <clears throat> Nevertheless, I'm against it at this time, and I'll tell you why. Um, I think everybody agrees that there's a safety problem in Broad Cove, the whole neighborhood, and the, the problem may be, to some extent, the volume, but the more important problem is the speed and type of traffic these uh, cars are driving too fast, and they're a lot of times reckless, and I think we should explore other options for controlling the, the um, quality of the traffic in there before we go paving roads. I mean, throwing pavement at a problem isn't always the answer. I'm afraid that if we rush into this at the end of the day, all we'll have is another dangerous road in the neighborhood, Jordan Farm Road. We won't have any uh, safety benefit on Broad Cove. So I recommend that before we go paving any more roads, we look at speed bumps, sidewalks, um, enforcement of the speed limit, and that type of thing, and any other options people can think of, but it requires more study. Um, that's all I had to say. I'm sure you've heard it before, but I just wanted to put my two cents in. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> my name's Nick Janazzo. I live at uh, 8 Roundabout Lane. I'll spell that for you. You'll never guess that <laughs> one. It's uh, G-N-A-Z-Z-O. And uh, quite honestly, whether this road gets opened or not doesn't affect me greatly in terms of uh, the location of, of my home. I do uh, tend to lean towards um, opening a second road because I think it's just ludicrous not to have a uh, second egress from an area that's been developed uh, the way um, this has. But really I'm here just to urge the council not to let this die right here. This needs to go on, it needs to be evaluated, and I would appeal to uh, every one of you to uh, continue to pass this on to the next uh, step, which I believe is the planning board. Um, it's uh, too uh, serious an issue not to uh, at least take that next step. So, <coughs> thank you. Thought you were done, right? I'm running out of space here on my paper. <laughs> my name is Frederick Emery. CJ and Jennifer and I live at 40 Broad Cove Road which is the last home on the left just before you Broad Cove heads down towards the ocean. And I've been sitting here the whole night, and uh, it's tough. I mean, it really is tough. And I don't envy all of you deciding. But I signed the petition, CJ and I both signed the petition, we're in support of it. It just seems to me it defies common sense to have 230 plus homes with only a single access road just defies common sense. It defies common sense to subject 93 homes along the way to that continual flow of traffic that we're talking about. Now I must confess, before tonight and listening to the people from Two Lights, I've been here 10 and a half years, 10 and a half uh, years now. CJ and I are both uh, Bangor natives originally. But uh, now we find ourselves down with our former competitors in the southern part of the state. But I must confess that as far as the Two Lights Road area in the proposed second access from Jordan Farm Road, uh, I never really looked at Two Lights Road as being an access to a neighborhood road like uh, Broad Cove Road is. And, and maybe I need to rethink that, but I had always looked at Two Lights Road as being kind of a major road of the town, like 77, well, not quite as much as 77, but similar to that. And so I, I have a little trouble tonight with the thought of an apples and orange comparison between Two Lights Road itself, not the neighborhoods off it, because I recognize those, uh, but Two Lights Road itself and Broad Cove Road, which is clearly just a neighborhood access road. And so I wanted to step up, register my support, Nobody's behind me unless somebody else wants to come up. Actually, I don't think there's anybody left that hasn't said something. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there any more comments from members of the public on this public hearing? Hearing none, I declare this public hearing closed.
Um, we have a task uh, for us this evening. We also have four other items on the agenda. So um, I will begin to entertain comments. I mean, uh, there's so many places that we can go uh, with the the information that we've got. We've received not only the comments, but we've received four or five packets of written information which we have not yet had an opportunity to even uh, read. So it is very difficult uh, when, when material is presented to you that night and then you're asked to make a decision on something and, and there might be information or material information in there that we haven't had a chance to absorb yet. So that's uh, one issue. Um, <clears throat> I appreciate everybody coming. I want to thank you, by the way, for the the numbers of letters, uh, I haven't counted them, but there's a voluminous number of letters that we've received from both sides, and it's a, it's a wonderful thing. Where we may be short a little this year for our appointments, we're not short in getting the number of people who are passionate about whatever their issue is in this town, so that's terrific. And we appreciate it, we appreciate your taking the time to come out this evening. Uh, and you can see by uh, the comments that come from your friends and neighbors the predicament that the council finds us in and this type of an issue since we all sit up here and know people and friends on both sides of the issue so it is very difficult now I will bring this back to the council um, and see see if we can get a debate going here I think we're a little shell-shocked um, get a debate going here and or uh, any other suggestions I am open for any other suggestions um, that you might have regarding this issue. Or at least just get the conversation going. Could I ask Maureen a question? Sure. I don't want to put her on the spot. Yeah, Maureen? Yeah. Oh, Maureen is the town planner. Maureen O'Meara is the town planner for the town of Cape Elizabeth. She has apparently expected to get asked something. She has a large packet with her. I've got a question for her too. So I'll keep her up here. She can wipe your leg with it. It's all your fault. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot. Maybe you don't know the answer, and that's fine. But in the packet we have, it says that there were 17 new homes constructed since 1997. Do you happen to know how many since 1990? Um, I can guess, guess that. Uh, you got 1997 because I believe the question that we were asked to, be, to answer was the number of homes that have been built since the emergency access road was constructed. Mm -hmm. And that's why uh, my, my review of the records, my best guess was it was actually completed right around 1997, and that's why we moved the numbers. I can tell you that the Highland subdivision, which was approved in 1991, was approved for 20 homes. Um, other than the Highland subdivision, there are some other vacant lots in Broad Cove that have been built over time. I can think of uh, two in Ragosa Way, and there's probably a few others. So. It, and not all of Broad Cove, not all of Broad Cove Highlands has been built out yet. There's still a few houses out there. So I would say from 1990 to the present, in the range of 20 homes. Thank you. I guess I wouldn't leave quite yet, Maureen. <laughs> uh, Councilor Roberts. Maureen, in the packet that we received, um, there was a study in there that was supposedly going to be done by the DEP or by the state or someone uh, to determine or compare runoff on a gravel road as opposed to a paved road. It had indicated that a gravel road after a period of time settles and apparently there's as much runoff from that as there is the paved surface, including gravel and whatever. Has that study ever been done? I never uh, followed up to see if the study had ever been done. I, I'd never heard of any publication of it because uh, we were re reviewing, we were using that as evidence uh, for an argument that the DEP uh, didn't give us approval for anyway. So I never followed up on it. Is that something you could do? I can try. It's, it's not something that people are really interested in, but yeah, it, I can try. Okay, is that it? Okay. I've got other comments if somebody doesn't want to jump in. Councilor McGinty? Um, were you here in 1990? Were you October of 1990. <laughs> Um, well, somebody mentioned that, that this, the access road was, a, the DEP was a compromise. I mean, I'm not sure exactly um, what, what was meant to be done, what they wanted to do, and mm -hmm. that this is a compromise. you know if that is, in fact, um, the case? As you're probably aware, with major subdivisions, it's a two-step process before the planning board. You get preliminary approval, 
then that's usually when you go to the state to get your, your permits and then you get final approval. I was not working for the town at the time of the preliminary approval process. I was here for the final approval process. So um, I spent a lot of time last month in the DEP records. Um, in reviewing those records, it, it was clear to me that the original position of the DEP was that there is an existing farm, farm, farm road there that was 12 feet wide, and that's all they wanted to give the town permission for. There was aggressive, aggressive lobbying by the town for exactly those safety issues. Uh, and the, the DEP agreed that it could be an emergency access road, but it could only be 12 feet wide. Uh, they were then, uh, it was then pointed out to them that the town had an existing ordinance that said emergency access roads had to be a minimum, fire lanes I believe is what they called it, it had to be a minimum of 18 feet wide and they eventually agreed to go from 12 feet to 18 feet. I remember from, not from the preliminary, preliminary but from the final approval process there was a further negotiation of were we going to be allowed shoulders adjacent to this 18 foot wide road and in the end, uh, they agreed to allow us shoulders, but normally the grade on a shoulder is three to one, a three to one slope, and I think in this we agreed to a two to one slope. It was, we ended up going with a narrower slope, which could be, could cause more erosion, but overall it has less width impact on the wetland. So my, percep my, my perspective on it is that it was a negotiated agreement. Thank you. Thank you, Mari. Great. Does anyone have any more questions of Maureen this time? Don't go away. No? Yeah, I guess they still want you to stay, Maureen. <laughs> Council McGinty. I don't know if this is for Maureen or maybe for Mike. Um, again, somebody mentioned about speed bumps not being allowed because there was only a single access road. No. I, yeah, you're correct that someone mentioned that, but uh, I don't recall that from a, our policy viewpoint that that was ever an issue. There were other reasons why we didn't want speed bumps but it was speed humps, but that was not one of them. Okay, thanks. Is it there any yes. Um, something I haven't figured out from all the reading of the approval from the DEP is why there was a need for two chains. I mean, that seems to take <laughs> longer uh, to undo there's been several explanations, but Michael, I think, is going to take yeah. it. The reason for that is because when, everyone, when anyone comes to a chain, there needs to be an opportunity for a turnaround. And it, it just happens that it's, as they come in from Two Lights Road, you want the cars to stop where there's still an opportunity to turn around without going in and then suddenly be faced with a long backup. So you have that on both sides. There is a turnaround at the end of the paved section. There, there is one in... in uh, the Blumenthal's driveway, but that's not a, a legal official turnaround. Uh, it's their property, yeah. so uh, that's that's not a public right of way. Their driveway. I mean, it does seem to be something that hinders being able to get through quickly in an emergency, which is the point. Of the yeah, in in looking at outlining possible actions for the council, I thought it was a no-brainer that there ought to be just one chain. But when you go down and you look at it real world in terms of discouraging folks from going where they ought not to go and, and not backing up into the wetland or whatever, it really shows when you look at it on site that the, the two chains uh, are much more beneficial if it is to have chains. Councillor Roberts. I'm familiar with the Bl Blumenthal's driveway. I was down there last week and I backed into it also. And I was questioning the two chains. I didn't know why a sign could not have been placed as the road turns from pavement to, to the gravel, and there is an area to turn around right there and, and again, get rid of one of those locks. Um, but, and I'm prepared to make some comments, I guess, too. It seems like we're dancing around the issue, and I'm, I might as well start it. Um, and I, I'm very familiar with the area down there. I served on the Conservation Commission for eight years. I'm sensitive to environmental issues. I've walked that entire parcel. <laughs> This past week, I drove down through Hannaford Cove Road. I drove into Shore Acres, trying to figure out if there might be some other access to accomplish what we need to do. And both of those areas, obviously, it just creates a whole new set of problems. It has to be resolved inside of Broad Cove, no matter what we do. We can't create the problem in either 
either one of those other two areas. There is, um, so I put my glasses on so I read my notes here. The town obviously is remiss in that they should have been more aggressive in ensuring a second egress as development occurred down there. Uh, 1970, the planning board blew it. And now we're faced with a situation that no matter what decision we make, half of the neighbors are going to be upset with us. That's, that's a given. Um, is there a, good, a really good answer to it? Not really. But there were a lot of comments tonight that were talking about damaging the wetland. And I'm not convinced of paving that at least 18 feet is going to damage the wetland. Um, and certainly if that was going to happen, the DEP would not allow it to occur. Um, I don't know what the relative difference is on the runoff between a, a paved road and a gravel road. Hopefully Maureen can get an answer to that for us. Uh, I would be willing to support a 20-foot wide paved surface with speed bumps and a posted speed limit of only 15 miles an hour. I don't believe with that type of an access road, you'd find a huge increase in traffic going across it because it would not make it quicker for people getting out of Broad Cove, but it would solve one of the safety issues. No matter what we're going to do, we're not going to solve the traffic speeding problem. It's going to be affected either way, and I don't think it's going to change it much in Broad Cove, but it would address the issue that people have of having a road that's open at midnight, if need be, if you've got to get out of there in a hurry because you've got an emergency, you've got a sick child or an elderly parent, you've got to get to help take care of them, whatever. That is not there now, and it's been testified over and over and over again here tonight that people have had problems, and the police department, or public works, or anyone else does not get down there on the first sign of trouble and drop that gate. So we need to do something. But having said that, I am concerned that uh, even proposing that we pave it, it's raising false hope because I don't think the DEP is going to do anything. The laws apparently have changed somewhat, but I'm willing to go that route and try it. Somebody else had mentioned using sidewalks to help eliminate the, or alleviate the problem on Broad Cove Road. I can hear the hue and cry now if we start taking people's property to put in sidewalks down there. It'll make the road that much wider looking and the traffic will go that much, more, much faster. So is that an answer? I don't think so. Um, so that's where I stand. Um, I went back and forth on this. Every letter I read, each report I read in the document, I went from yes, we should, to no, we shouldn't, to yes, we should. I finally decided last night that this was perhaps at least a compromise in having a very narrow paved surface with the speed bumps and, um, and, a, and a reduced speed limit. And again, it would have to be enforced. But that's where I stand. Good check. Came out with a position here. <laughs> um, are there any comments? Councillor Fritz. Um, I, I guess I really do worry about moving traffic from one neighborhood to another and putting traffic on two lights, which actually turned out to be a lot heavier traffic than I, I really had expected. Um, I. I think there's a problem with a, a straight road. I've said this before when we were talking about bike paths, and I think the tendency, if you have a wider road, a straighter road, that people will go faster. Um, and it already has high volume. And the point that it's not developed out yet, the two lights area, means that there, there will end up being higher traffic volumes yet on that road. Um, and I, one thing I don't think has been mentioned very much is, I mean, if you divert half the traffic out of Broad Cove, send it down Two Lights Road, it ends up coming out onto 77 in very close connection there. Um, so that I think you could be creating quite a dangerous little intersection there. Um, that would not be a good idea from a safety standpoint. Um, some people have said that the cost prob would probably not be as high as uh, the manager has suggested. Um, but I think if we, if we attempted to widen the road, we w might have to take some land by eminent domain, which was not mentioned there. And I think it, if we actually widened the road and provided 
access to there, it should be a wider road because that is access for the neighborhood to get to the state parks. Um, so I, I think that it would not be a safe pedestrian area if it wasn't made wide. I'm, I'm, I would be very nervous about allowing access through there for that many cars and keeping it at 20 feet wide. Um, I really think that a compromise was made a number of years ago when, when the DEP approval was made and when the planning board dealt with this issue. Um, because I think the, the issue at that time on, on safety was really uh, getting emergency vehicles in to the neighborhood. And being, if there was a storm, if a tree crossed the road, being able to have a secondary access. And so I think that the emergency access road as it is now was the compromise. Um, I think that we should be able to deal with that emergency access better than we are right now. Um, I don't know if there are breakaway chains that people could actually break away rather than waiting for public safety to come down. I think public safety could also be able to open it up more easily and more quickly. Um, I don't recommend speed bumps. I have, I, I'm on a private road and we debated speed for I think 15 years and finally went with speed bumps and um, a speed table is what we have and that really is not a solution because people drive up to it at the same speed as they used to go, stop or go slowly over the speed bump and then tear off again and, and I, I don't think it, it works the way it's intended. Um, I think we need to have that road open when the paving is done or when there are major projects on the road. Um, again, I think we only need one chain. Um, I, I do think speed in, uh, enforcement is something we really ought to take more seriously. I mean, I think when we um, had some extra police effort in the neighborhood a year or so ago, um, I don't know that any tickets were actually issued. I think if tickets were issued, and, and it was a concentrated time, I think people would believe it like they do at Pearl's Neck, because people do believe it out there. Um, so I, I'm not in favor of the town requesting uh, a re-look at, at this proposal to the planning board or to the DEP, but that we look for some other ways to provide better access through the emergency access route that we have. Point of order, Madam Chairman. Um, Point of order. I, are we supposed to suspend the rules to go after? That's what I would like to do now. I'd like to do that. Our, our, our rules, council rules, require that we stop at 11 o'clock. It's because in my older times here that we used to go to 1 o'clock. So we will ask for a motion. Just point of point of clarification. The council rules provide that a new item may not be taken, taken up, up after. after. 11, so you're you're okay with this item? Okay. Okay. All right. Um, it's interesting the amount of conversation that both. Um, the citizens have had and we've had about speed since speed is only yourselves. I mean, it's only your neighbor that's speeding. Um, and, you know, we can send all the police down there. I mean, I don't know how we do it. It's pretty hard to hide a police car down there somewhere. But you're only talking about your neighbor. And so you need to deal with that uh, in, inside. It's your, each of yourselves need to look at yourselves for that. I wanted to ask Maureen, are you over there, Maureen? Oh, yes, ma'am. <laughs> um, I have to say, and also listening to all your wetlands, that I was born in Cape Elizabeth, and I want to tell you that entire plot of land is a wetland. There were three or four streams down there. It was major farmland, I mean, open meadows, and all wetland everywhere. So I suspect every one of your houses is built on a wetland. So it's, it's uh, now you're down to this poor little piece of wetland there. But one of the things I do remember, and I hesitate to say it since I don't know where everybody lives, is there, when you come in Broad Cove after you pass St. Bart's, a 
couple of places down on the right, there was another proposed road. Now, don't get excited. I just, I just want to know. <laughs> <laughs> it's one connecting the roundabout. It was, where is it? It was supposed to connect with just with roundabout? Yeah. Can you show me where, where, sure. where it was, Murray? And it's still on here. It's, it's a paper it's, road, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, this is Broad Cove Road right here. And my understanding, and Michael can correct me if I get this wrong, is that it was actually constructed at some point when sewer was being installed as, mm -hmm. as a connection for the neighborhood. And then after the sewer construction ended, it was let to go back to what it is, which is wetland. Um, but in fact, uh, it's right here. And if you drive down Bog Broad Cove Road and you know where to look, you can almost see what might be a road at one point. But it goes right into a wetland area that's now owned by the town. Mm. So that's as far as it was ever going to go, was to roundabout. It wasn't ever supposed to connect. Yeah, it, it was laid out. It was re it's a recorded subdivision to do this. Yeah. Um, but this, this is very wet in here. Right. Hmm. So in your immediate thought, I don't want anyone to get excited, but is, is there, is there um, <laughs> any place else that we can exit this neighborhood? I don't know. Maybe, I don't, maybe I shouldn't ask that because I really don't want There's to. There's always a place. <laughs> huh? It's whether you want there's, to do it or not. There's none with the she public like currently has the right of way. There's, there's private property. Oh, okay. So we know there's no other paper roads in there. There's no. Well. If there was an access to Shore Acres, that, that'd have to go through privately. The, the, the well. Shore Acres thing I know is not publicly owned at this time. There's a sewer easement across there, and there might be a drainage, but it's there's not a vehicular right mm. through there. Well, I mean, clearly, um, we wouldn't today build a neighborhood with 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 one access road, and um, clearly, if everybody in this neighborhood wants an access road, you should all look at the maps to see if there's a place that it can be squeezed out of there. I mean, I, I have no absolutely no solution to what you're doing, what you're talking about tonight except there were several comments made about we should be looking for another alternative. So now I'm asking if there's another alternative. And there doesn't, at least at this point, appear to be. Um, I, I can't even see where. And there's nothing that goes that you can go across. <laughs> um, behind, I don't know. There's, OK, there's never mind. That go out to see. <laughs> out to there's see. There's nothing that's blatantly aware of that yeah. I, Things happen over time. I, I would never say never, but. Right. Right. Okay. Those are my only two questions right then is the alternative. Uh, uh, Councilor Swift Kayata. Um, I'd just like to lay out where my thoughts are at this point. Um, this is a really tough issue, as everybody knows, um, not just for this, those of us on the council, but those of you who live in the neighborhoods involved. Um, the problem stated in the citizen petition, which started this whole thing, well, there were several problems, but they related to safety, meaning the volume and the speed of traffic and also emergency access, a decreased quality of life in Broad Cove, um, an issue of fairness that we should do the best we can for the majority of, of residents. And then there was some mention also of whatever solution we came up with, try to do it with the least environmental impact and the lowest cost, um, that those should be factors and solutions. 146 people signed that, I believe. Um, and I haven't counted the signatures here, but it, it appears to me that we have as many or more on these counter petitions. So that sort of leaves me with Okay. Okay. Thank you. 147 homes, and and I I don't know what we have homes, individu individuals, well, we whatever, because we haven't had a chance to look at chance. petitions on the other side. But in any event, those were the problems that I thought I should be looking at, because those were the problems laid out in the petition. So how should I decide this? That's what I was trying to think about yesterday. Um, I'm, I'm not Solomon, you know. I, I had to really think about this like Jack. I've gotten, a, and everybody else, I've gotten a lot of letters. I've gotten phone calls. I've gotten people buttonholing me in IGA. And, um, you know, it's a real tough issue. So I decided that I would try to make my decision based on facts, not opinions, wherever possible, that wherever there were facts that were available. 
and that I'd make my decision based on the following factors, four factors, safety, environmental impact, cost, and fairness. And, and what I mean by that is the greater good for um, Cape Elizabeth citizens. So that's sort of my process. So where does that leave me? Safety, speed of traffic. I tried to break it down into some subcomponents here. Speed of traffic. To my mind, opening Jordan Farm Road is, is not going to address that problem. It sounds like it's a really significant problem, however, and I think there are other things that we can and should do to address that problem. But I don't think that opening the, the other end of the neighborhood is going to do anything to address speeding, if it's anything like any neighborhood I've ever been in. So we need to look for other ways to address speeding. I'm not saying it's not important, but I don't think opening the road is going to have much impact on it either way. Volume of traffic. Yes, opening another road, I think, would affect volume of traffic. But what we have to remember is the total volume of traffic is not going to change. We're just talking about rerouting it to someplace else. And the people who live out on um, Two Lights Road have made that point several times. Um, as best as I can determine, and I've heard a number of different sets of numbers here, 182 lots or about three quarters of the lots are on the Broad Cove Road side of the midpoint. And the midpoint is like 7,000 feet in yeah. if you did a loop. So three quarters of the traffic would probably still be going out Broad Cove Road even if jo Jordan Farm Road were opened up. Now that doesn't pers make, persuade me one way or the other, but it is a fact that people on Broad Cove Road are still going to get what I could consider a lot of traffic. It may be 25% less, but it's still going to be a lot. But it would be less. Um, if I look at traffic counts, volume of traffic, I was trying to deal with facts here. If I look at the town study that the manager had some consultants do for us, it shows that Broad Cove Road, it was measured at three places, Broad Cove Road just a little bit up from St. Bart's, Hunts Point Road, and then Two Lights Road. And these were all measured in October sort of late September, early October. Um, the place that that probably has the most impact would be on, in terms of seasonality, would be Two Lights Road, because that would not be the, the peak there, I wouldn't think. It would probably get more traffic in the summer. But even at a non-peak time of year, it shows that Two Lights Road gets 15 or more percent more traffic um, per day than uh, Broad Cove Road does. So they've already got more traffic. If you took, if you opened up the new road and funneled a quarter of the traffic out, the traffic on Broad Cove Road would go from what my numbers show, 1834 a day to um, 1357 a day. It would drop by a quarter. That's down 477 cars. If you threw those 477 cars onto two lights, you'd go up to almost 2,600 cars a day. So right now, you've got Broad Cove at 1,800, two lights at 2,100, 15% higher on two lights. If you open the new road and everybody you know, followed the way we think they'd follow, you'd have 1,350 on Broad Cove Road. You'd have almost 2,600 on two lights road. You'd have 91% more. You'd have almost double the traffic on two lights road than on Broad Cove Road. So some homes in Broad Cove, that's sort of on the, the northern half there, the pink section, um, the ones that are right along the road, not the side roads, would get a 26% decrease. But the, the homes on two lights who are already getting more traffic would get a lot more traffic, almost double. So, okay, so that's one factor. Emergency access is another a aspect, a very important aspect, and I've heard a lot of people talk about that tonight. Um, according to my talks with the manager and with the police chief, Jordan Farm Road, since, since it's been a gravel road, gated road, it is working well. Now, I've heard some things here tonight which have led me to believe that it may not be working as well as it could be working. And I think those are things we can address. Um, 
However, I don't necessarily think that means paving the road or opening the road. Last factor in safety that I looked at was accidents. Last five years, there have been five accidents, an average of one a year. And I know these are only recorded once. I know there's been all these near misses on both roads that people have talked about, but recorded there have been five accidents, an average of one a year on Broad Cove Road. Two Lights Road, there's been 20 accidents, an average of four a year. In terms of violations, which is, you know, speeding tickets and stuff, Broad Cove Road, um, 78, but that includes 54 in a few weeks, given in 1998, <coughs> when there was a, not a speed trap, because I would never call it a speed trap, <laughs> but there were some cruisers apparently sitting there um, who, giving, who were giving out tickets to people who were speeding. Um, and by the way, 82% of the speeding tickets were given that were given out were given to residents of Broad Cove of the neighborhood. So Penny's point is true. Just like in my neighborhood, most of the people who speed are the people who live in my neighborhood. And just in everybody's neighborhood, frankly, most of the people who speed, unless you live on 77, live in that neighborhood. So there have been four times more accidents on two lights than on Broad Cove Road. There are many more violations. Environmental impact was the next thing I looked at. I have to think about Jordan Farm Road as a public road right now, uh, publicly owned road. It provides open space for all Cape citizens. I know there are people who aren't from the, either one of the neighborhoods who go down there and park and walk their dogs and jog and do whatever. Um, wetlands, I am, no, unlike Jack, I was not on the Conservation Commission and I am not, this is not one of my big issues. On the other hand, I have to think about the fact that the DEP, the main DEP, explicitly considered and rejected a paved road, as I understand it, in 1990, 91, 93, and 96 in their decisions. And I see no evidence that the environment, that the situation has changed since then, so I don't understand why they would reconsider. Um, like Jack, I don't think that they would change their minds. Um, <coughs> because only a gravel 18-foot wide gated road for emergency access has been approved by the DEP. So to pave it and open it for full access, I, you know, there's, there's some questions about it. How many feet wide would it have to be? I think it would have to go from 18 to anywhere up to 34 feet. I don't think you could keep it at 18. And I think there could be significant negative environmental impact on an area that's used by all Cape residents. Cost, we can argue about the cost, but it's anywhere from 25,000 to 150 grand. And if you look at that, that's going to be borne by all property owners and in this town. And something that I also hear about from all citizens on a regular basis every year when we do the budget is how property taxes are really high and we have to set priorities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I have had some people say to me, why should the town spend up to 150 grand to benefit only a certain subset? Now, that happens with all projects, so I'm not going to make that argument. However, some people in this town will be incensed to think that we, when they have significant traffic problems on Mitchell Road or on Old Ocean House Road or whatever, that Fowler Road, Fowler Road, <laughs> <laughs> he lives on Fowler Road, that um, we're going to spend this kind of money. And I have to think about that because I have a fiscal duty to all the citizens of Cape Elizabeth. So lastly, fairness. People in the petition said, do what's right for the most citizens. And that's what I'm trying to think about. But I think I'm defining the citizens as bigger than just in Broad Cove neighborhood. I'm looking at two lights and the other neighborhoods beyond there. And I'm also looking at some impacts that we'd have on the whole town. So on safety, Two Lights Road also already has more traffic and more accidents than Broad Cove. If we opened the new road, Two Lights Road would get almost two times the traffic. On emergency access, I think there is room for improvement, but I don't, I think all the cruisers and fire trucks have keys to the gates. We, I think we can institute procedures that will make it easier and quicker for the police to come down and open that road whenever it needs to be opened. Um, so I'm not persuaded on the emergency access issue. On environmental impact, the DEP, I don't think, will permit the road. And even if, even if they did, 
I think there would be significant um, negative impact to the environment in opening it up. Um, and that's space that's now used by many Cape citizens and available to all for recreational use. And then on cost, as I, uh, as I said, it would be basically $1,800 per lot fronting on Broad Cove Road. That the to if you took the total cost of this project, it would be paying $1,800 per lot along um, Broad Cove Road to decrease the traffic 25% there. So I guess you can see where I'm going. Uh, I've received a, a great deal of citizen input on both sides of the issue. And what I have discovered, no surprise to anyone here, is that your point of view usually depends on where you live and how you personally are going to be impacted. Um, since the decision involves traffic reallocation, not elimination, I think we need to include people on Jordan Fire Road on the, on, the other, on the two lights side of the gate and two lights road. We have to factor them into the equation as well as everyone else who could use this open space and every taxpayer. So all, on all those factors, safety, environmental impact, cost, and fairness to all, I'm not in favor of opening up the road and paving it. My conclusion is that we should not do that, and I do not want to pass it along to the DEP, uh, to the planning board, or ask the DEP to uh, do anything further with it. However, I don't want to ignore what I think is a significant problem um, of safety, principally speeding on Broad Cove Road. I think the town manager should work with the police chief to provide added speed enforcement on Broad Cove. I think Broad Cove residents need to um, address speeding the way we've tried to do in, in my neighborhood. And I'll tell you, it hasn't been real successful in my neighborhood, but peer pressure can, can be brought to bear. We can investigate speed tables, but I think it's unlikely that there'll be a solution. I have in my neighborhood, and it's the same as in Carol's neighborhood. People speed like crazy up to them, bump over them, and then just continue sp speeding. Um, and then lastly, I think we can institute a better process for lowering the chain in emergencies. So that's where I am. Um, I really appreciate everyone's input, and I fully realize that probably half the people in the room are pleased with what I just said and half are not pleased, but I, I want you to know that I have really considered this carefully and I've tried to be fair and consider everybody's input. And I appreciate you taking the time to uh, come out, it's very late, and, and participate in this process. Thank you. Thanks. Council McGinty. And I'm glad I let you go before me because uh, <laughs> now I won't have to talk for so long. Um, I think that, uh, and I'm kind of parrot many of the things you've said. I think that the, the DEP did make a compromise all the way through this and to where we are today. Um, but they didn't want a road built there, paved road built there. And uh, so the compromise has already been made. As far as the speeding, it is an enforcement issue that needs to be dealt with through the town manager and the, the police chief, um, obviously. As far as the gates not being down when they, sh they should have been, again, that's a procedural issue that needs to be taken up through the Public Safety Department and the Public Works Department to, um, to make sure that those gates get down when needed um, immediately. And, uh, you know, as far as all the traffic issues, I think we are just shifting the problem from Broad Cove Road over to the Two Lights side, uh, the Two Lights neighborhood. And um, as I said, I'm glad you went first because I'm not going to repeat everything you said, but I agree with um, just about everything you said. And uh, I don't support opening that road for those, for those reasons. Councilor Barry, are you? There, there isn't very much that I can say that hasn't been said, but uh, I, mm -hmm. I share that same position. I, I know that uh, the uh, Broad Cove Road is uh, 23 to 24 feet wide. The Two Lights Road is 25 to 26 feet wide, so no more than a foot or two. Uh, as far as width on the two lights road to uh, shift the problem from one neighborhood to another neighborhood on speed and, and volume doesn't make sense to me because I think there are some hundred uh, homes down the two lights road and in the summertime when this uh, traffic count was taken in October that does not represent the, uh, the, the full impact of the traffic that goes down there in the summertime to that restaurant and to the state park. I've lost three cats myself down that road. And uh, I think that a better uh, enforcement can be uh, uh, spruced up along the Broad Cove Road. People should not have to be afraid on either one of those roads 
of uh, their children being hit. On, on the Two Lights Road, there are 20 children in that daycare center right there that uh, are out there every day. There are children waiting for the bus, just as there are in the other neighborhood. So I don't see the sense of shifting the problem from one neighborhood to the next. But uh, I think that we should address the enforcement and make sure that uh, the people who are speeding get either slowed down or taken off the road. Thank you. Is that? Did you? You there? I um, <clears throat> have a certain prerogative, actually. I don't. After I let all the rest of the councilors speak, you know, <laughs> I often feel like I don't have to come forward. But when you are the last one to speak, um, most everything that you could say, if it if it happens to be your point of view, has been said, and I, I will not repeat that. But I, too, have given this a lot of thought, and I was, I was there the first time. I, I was around the first time this came up, and, and I'm here this time when it came up. And um, where I, I sympathize tremendously with those people who have got uh, an increase in cars going past their house, I cannot deal with I think internally, as a neighborhood, you've got to try and deal with the speed issue yourself, no matter how many policemen we send down there to do that. You, you absolutely... Uh, you absolutely, you're going to know who your neighbors are, and you're going to be able to recognize them, and you've got to try to do that. I mean, what can you do? Send a policeman to park there every day? You think that'll do it? I don't know if that'll do it. But it's your own children. It's their children. How about if you double the fine for the people on the other half of the neighborhood? I don't think that this is in order right now for me to debate you at this time. We, we, you have uh, had an opportunity, and, and it's our opportunity now, so I, I'm... I'm sorry, because I know that half of you are disappointed and half of you are not so disappointed. But I, I tend to agree with what's been said, that I think that this is not the time again for us. That our, We've believed uh, um, last time, and I believe this time, that it would be extraordinarily difficult to get the DEP to change those regulations that they were wrote before. And I don't, I, I don't know, and I'm not in a position to say for sure. So I, for several of the reasons, I too am going to disagree. and. Um, decide that this is not the time to move the problems from one neighborhood to another neighborhood. Um, and I will probably not support this issue. So, I need to call the vote, please. It, it is, I'm sorry, we, we are in our debating process, and um, I hope that all the questions have been asked. I can't let one person, because then we'd be in a real problem here. So I need to call the question. I know. I need, a, I need the motion to go. Someone's going to make a motion. One of the ways, Jack, you have a motion, the point of view that you're interested in, you should. Well, I'd move that we refer to the matter to the planning board to request permission to pave a 20-foot uh, roadway with speed bumps and a, a posted speed limit not to exceed 15 miles per hour. What was that with? 20 feet. 15, 15? miles per hour. Oh, yeah, but the f width 20 of the road? 20. Wide. A 20 foot wide. 20 foot wide. If somebody wants to Is there a second? They better second, but at least for purposes of discussion. Uh, <laughs> motion fails for lack of s second. I'll entertain a second motion. Councilor McGinty. I'll, I'll, I'll follow my sword, I guess. Um, you know, so this is a lose lose situation, as, like I think Ann said. Half the people in the room are going to be upset with us, and half are going to be happy with us. But um, I move that the uh, petition requesting that all of Jordan Farm Road be paved with full-time access uh, be denied, and the matter not be referred to the planning board or to the DEP. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? I call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? Thank you very much. I need a motion to suspend the rules, please. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to suspend the rules. All those in favor? Wait a minute. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. We're going to just wait for them to leave before we sit down.
Conversations move outside. Talk about that's it's not we don't resolve these. Number 48, public hearing and action upon proposed revised attendances to the general assistance regulations. I don't think there's anyone here <laughs> in the public anymore to have a hearing. Therefore, I declare it opened and closed. Let the minutes reflect. I've already got So that we happened. opened it and we closed it. All right. Does anyone need to hear anything from Michael about this? You get this item in your packet. This is on your thing, Jack, with the, the, the public Wait, assistance me? business. No, this is. You want Michael to just give you a quick explanation, Henry, on no, what uh, no, no, no. the item is? Yeah. <laughs> uh, we've discussed this in the committee. Oh, okay. So you're all right? Yes. I guess I would this is, this is, excuse me, I think Council Perry may be confused. This has nothing to do with Thomas Jordan, which you discussed in this that committee. Oh, yeah. These are the appendices to the general assistance regulations, and we received copies of them from the State okay. of Maine Department of Human Services who instructed us that, one, we had to hold a public hearing on it, but two, we had to put them immediately in place, right. regardless of what action the council took. Right, thank you. So you need to put them immediately in place. Do I, do I understand the amounts here? Is the, I mean, are we one of the SMSA? We're in the standard metropolitan statistical area for Cumberland County. Yes. So we do not, ha we have the lower of the Cumberland County figures to plug in. We don't have We're the in the higher. SMSA. Right. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I just have a comment to make. I actually we could adopt these by reference only if it if we to change the ordinance at some point to say state that we would automatically adopt the food stamp level from year to year. It's just done administratively. It doesn't have to come to the council every year. I know that for a fact. But it doesn't. It's true. It doesn't take very long. I mean, this is. I don't know if I want to decide that tonight. Let's just ask the motion to move no, on. No, just move on. <laughs> we can decide that. You can bring that forward again. <laughs> I probably won't. Uh, yes. Councilman McGinty. Um, I move that we accept the 2000-2001 General Assistance Ordinance Appendix Appendices A, B, and C as presented. I second it. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? So it's done. Thank you. Item number 49, action upon a request from the Proputa Club to approve the renewal malt, spiritus, and vinous license and special amusement permit. I move that we approve the uh, Proputa Club uh, license. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Opposed, none. Thank you. Item number 50, action upon proposed amendments to the purchasing procedure. I decided not to withdraw oh. from site. And which one? No. Um, oh, Pudic. 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 Oh, yeah. Pointed out that it wasn't, I'm not in a decision making no. role. <laughs> so. Well, I have a, a quick question on the purchasing procedure. Mm -hmm. when, when did we adopt, Mike, do you remember when we adopted this procedure? Yeah, was it? It was originally done about 15, 16 years ago. The last revision, I think, was in 91. Well, not since long. Not since 91. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about the purchasing procedure? I'll entertain a motion for that. 
I move we accept the proposed amendments to the purchasing procedure. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Item number 51, action upon a, upon a request from Ferris on New England, Inc. and Central Maine Power Company for poll location on Jordan Way. <laughs> Has the poll been moved? I have a question. Has the poll been erected? It no. is not, but Michael said it was close this time. We were tempted, because this is for the temporary dispatch center, and we were getting a little bit wary, but I don't, last I checked, it wasn't up there. <laughs> All move, right. I move that permission be granted to uh, erect it. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. Hearing none, I will now entertain a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. second. We're moved and seconded. Any for, all those in favor? Opposed? Thank you.